NCAA basketball is brought to you by BMW, the ultimate driving machine. To arrange a thorough test drive, simply phone your nearest BMW dealer. By Bud Light, everything else is just a light. By Nike, maker of the world's premier athletic shoes. And by Good News Plus with the Louvre Smooth Strip for extra smoothness and comfort only from Gillette. Welcome back once again. Just about ready to get underway. They say that this is the coach's time of year, so we are joined by our coach, and this is, without question, the greatest time of year. John, for me, it is absolutely, I think it's the greatest sporting event of all. You can talk about the Super Bowl, the N NHL playoffs, and all the different playoffs that exist and professionally, but there's nothing like the Russian roulette as to what we're going to see now. All the experts, quote-unquote, these experts with all their predictions, forget about it. There's so much emotion and intensity, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful time of the year for a guy like myself who loves it. Our first game, Auburn and Bradley. Interesting matchup. We have one team, Auburn, very strong inside. Bradley, on the other hand, is a little weak inside. But Bradley has the guards and Auburn might not. Well, Bradley has the great backcourt with Anthony Manuel, who really dishes it out with the best of them. Of course, he has someone to dish to because he's given it up to a guy like Mr. Hersey Hawkins, you know, different than myself. If I come down and penetrate and give it to you, you're not going to convert, but <laughs> you can't play. But Mr. Hawkins, to me, I've been saying it from day one, deserves the Player of the Year award. I'm so happy to see the writers honor him, and I think he should be the Naismith Player of the Year as well. He's just had a phenomenal year. Every team goes into the game knowing they have to stop Hersey Hawkins, but the not too many teams get it done. What does Auburn Sonny Smith have to do to this game to stop her? Well, Hershey first Hawkins. of all, he'll control tempo, John. He's an excellent guy at doing that, Sonny Smith. He did it against Kentucky, where I didn't think he had a chance. He went into Kentucky. Nobody gave him an opportunity or a chance. He played without Michael Jones, who was ineligible academically. He played without the, uh, the big guy who's back now, Jeff Moore, a good inside player. Morris can be spectacular. The question mark is their backcourt. If their backcourt can control tempo of the game, they should be in command. Man. However, Bradley and Stan Albeck, it's run, baby, run. Up and down we go. I'll have Paul Westhead with Loyola Marymount, who's going down today to Wyoming. But I'll tell you this right now. Yeah, Fennis Dumbo will shoot them down. Hersey Hawkins will start today. They average 93 points a game, the Braves do. We are just beginning. He's wound up already. Right now, let us go out to Atlanta, the Southeast reader. Mike Patrick and Bob Ortigal standing by. Our first game, Auburn and Bradley. Bradley and Auburn set to go from the Omni in Atlanta. First round of the NCAA. Let's get the starting lineups from public address announcer Marshall Mann. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first game of the 1988 NCAA Southeast Regional first and second round games in Atlanta. Here are today's starting lineups for our first game featuring the Braves of Bradley and the Tigers of Auburn. Starting at forward for Bradley, number 24, Donald Powell. And for Auburn, number 34, Chris Morris. Also at forward for Bradley is number 40, Trevor Trippy. For Auburn, number 22, John Kaler. Starting at center for Bradley, number 53, Luke Jackson. And for Auburn, number 40, Jeff Moore. Starting at guard for Bradley, number 12, Anthony Manuel. Howard. Also at guard for Bradley is number 33, Hersey Hawkins. And for Auburn, number 24, Derek Dennison. The head coach for Bradley is Stan Albeck. And the head coach for Auburn is Sonny Smith. Auburn 18 and 10, Bradley 26 and 4, and we'll be back with the start of this ball game in just a moment.
Mike Patrick and Bob Ortical with you from the Omni in Atlanta. Bradley against Auburn. The opening game of the NCAA tournament. We're in the Southeast region. Here are your officials, Jack Cannon, Dick Lynch, and David Hall. Bradley comes out in its red road uniforms. Auburn in the home whites. And keep an eye on number 33 in red, Hersey Hawkins, the nation's leading scorer. Also watch 24 in white, Derek Dennison. He's the young man who is starting, and he will draw the assignment of playing Hawkins man-to-man. -man. Auburn controls the opening tip. This is Terrence Howard, the point guard. Bradley picks up Mike in their normal man-to-man -man defense. They'll play that most of the time. Morris with the first miss. And overthrown by Manuel as he tried to go down court to Donald Powell. You can count on the fact that you will see a lot of transition from the Bradley Braves, the defensive end of the floor to the offensive end of the floor, about as quickly as they can get there. And as a result, they will turn it over from time to time. Morris helping out against the pressure. Racing in there by Howard, but he missed the shot. He will get the foul inside, Heller. Howard did a very good job of beating his man, but he, he really had an open path all the way to the basket. Look here, the Bradley help side leading Auburn on the board, 1970. Manuel tried to get the bounce pass off. Pretty decent inside defense. Ahead of the pack, Carpenter had it stuck. The foul will be called, however, on Terry Thomas. That will be his second. Carpenter should have given up the ball to 22 John Taylor that time, Mike. Missouri staying in the zone. That's Green's second shot in a row he's missed. You can tell when he starts getting tired. Just a little off to the right for the aim. Hardy. Leonard having it knocked away. Garrett, it'll be two on two. Green on the left side. It goes and a foul. They get him for charging. I thought it was interesting. Green was having a hard time going from offense to defense, but when they got that run, by golly, he got a second win, and he was right in the break. Actually, he should have had the pass. Tom Garrett draws the foul as Tom Pender, in the second year up at Rhode Island, looks on. Leading scores in the ball game. Rhode Island zones is 16. She just has 15 for the Tigers. She was a bunch of rebounds. I think six uh, right off the top of my head. So he's doing it. Continuing the hot streak of more than 15 games now with uh, 20 or more points. Leonard. Chivas. Chivas has 17. And it's 36 36. We have our fourth time. Five times. Missouri and Rhode Island in a tight first half battle. Let us now return to the southeast to Atlanta. Auburn and Bradley, the Braves behind Hersey Hawkins, opening up a big lead. That level. We've got 2.57 to go in the first half, and it's Bradley over Auburn, 49 38. Hawkins. You saw the quick release. He comes off, off of a down pick, gets the basketball, and it's gone before the defensive man realizes what happened. 23 points first half for Hersey Hall. And he's a great free throw shooter. Hawkins hits them both. His 36-point average, by the way, the best in the NCAA since Freeman Williams in 1977. Auburn would love to get this thing under 10 points before halftime. They'd like to go to the locker room. Pretty down good defensive pressure. Yeah, they've extended a bit defensively. Four back to Howard. Morris is out of there right now to get a breather. And they've been so used to going to him that their offense looks a little ineffectual with him out of there right now. Very ill-advised pass that time. It was forced inside, collapsing Bradley defense was there, but they turn it right back over to Auburn. 53-43, Auburn basketball, 51 seconds to go first half. Lynn with a runner. Here comes Manuel. Will they hold it for one? Forget it. They may never have held it for one shot. Howard will, Howard. 
little bit of a forced pass on Hawkins' part that time. He had a pretty start the second half, only eight down. Moore didn't get the roll, but Taylor tipped it in. Howard is hurt. He sure is. Terrence Howard fell hard at the buzzer. And they're going to need to get him some attention. That's the end of the first half. Our score is Bradley 53, Auburn 45. We'll be back after this message and a word from your local station. This is an NCAA Productions telecast. Thank you, gentlemen. 53 to 45 is your halftime score. Hersey Hawkins, what a tremendous job he did in the first half. We'll hear more about him from Dick Vitale in just a moment. But let us check some other scores from the East Regional at the Dean Dome. Rhode Island and Missouri. This has been a seesaw affair. Missouri ripped off an 8 to 2 run to end the first half, and they lead Rhode Island 40 to 38. That is your halftime score. In the Midwest, this being played in South Bend, Indiana. Purdue against Fairley Dickinson. Purdue, the Boilermakers and coach Gene Cady say this will be their year, and they get off to a quick start in this one, holding the first half lead behind Melvin McCants. Ryan Burning misses the baseline turnaround, but Melvin McCants will be right there. Gets up and tips this one home. McCants led the Boilermakers in the first half, and they lead it right now. 39-23 to 23 is the score over Fairley Dickinson, and we have to ask you, Coach Dick Vitale. Purdue, Gene Cady says... His team has struggled in the past, but they are an experienced club this time around. They've got the seniors in there, and this will be their year. Well, they have a lot of the ingredients. The big break they have, they happen to be in the weakest division. I happen to think that's the Tony Tubbs division when you talk <laughs> about the Midwest. And I know you like uh, Mr. Tyson like I do, and that heavyweight division is the East. I don't think there's a lot of balance throughout the uh, placement of the teams as in the past. You know, you have Fairley Dickinson in here, and I certainly don't want to say this to aggravate anybody, but I really believe this, uh, John. I think I would personally rather see the best 64 teams in America in the tournament. You can't tell me Ohio State's not a better team than Fairley Dickinson. I think the automatic berths are what create problems for our committee, as opposed to just getting the best teams in the nation. Now I sound like Scrooge. I'm not trying to eliminate the little guy. But my feeling is this. If you don't operate under the same pressure cooker, like the guys in the highly visible programs in the heavyweight divisions, then I don't think you should be able to take that money and be part of that big dance. I really do. That's my feeling. This is something I agree with you on. Oh, but wow, your buddy wow, at you NC agree. State, your buddy at NC State, Jim Valvano, says this is America. Well, I don't want to hear that dream. stuff. <laughs> Valvano's unbelievable. Forget about what he says. We'll have more on that in just a moment. Stay with us. The battle continues here on the NCAA Tournament today. Back with more, including a look at our games later. But first of all, the score you're concerned with right now, the Braves lead it. I haven't heard too much about North Carolina A&T, a and uh, I hear they're a pretty good ball club, though, and um, we're, they'll probably have a lot of fans since we're playing in uh, North Carolina, but I think if we just execute well, we can uh, beat them and uh, a, lot of, a lot of teams in the country, and we just have to make it up in our mind what we have to do, and we just have to go out there and do it. Meanwhile, the Aggies of North Carolina A&T making their seventh NCAA appearance. Looking for their first victory. Don Corbett's team, big underdog, despite the fact they have a 26 and 2 record. I know Syracuse is a potent team. You know, you don't begin the season as a preseason number one in the nation, uh, finish up as run up the year before, and not be the type of ball club that they are. But we're looking forward to the challenge. You know, every year that we've been to the NCAA, it's been a David Goliath type situation. And this is our best ball club, and I feel that we're going to have a chance to break through. This is our year. North Carolina A&T will lucky the seven be the charm as they face the Syracuse Orangemen 2.30 Eastern time. Stay with us. Coming your way, we will preview Wyoma and Loyola, another game you'll see here on ESPN. Right back in just a minute. Back to the Southeast in just a moment, but we continue the previews of the game you'll see here on ESPN. At 4.30, we move to the West, which should be a run-and-gun game. Wyoming, the Cowboys, to face the Lions of Loyola Marymount at 4.30 Eastern time. That one coming your way, of course. Loyola, the champions of the WCAC. Wyoming, the champions from the WAC, and they are hot at the appropriate time. Paul Westhead of the Lions says the Cowboys are peaking at the appropriate time. They're a very, very fine, you know, basketball team. You know, they were unstoppable early in the year. They, they kind of got slowed down a little bit uh, in their tournament play, in their league play. 
but uh, Denbo uh, is, uh, is truly one of the best players in the country, and certainly Eric Lickner, a local fellow who lives a stone's throw from, uh, from Loyola Marymount, uh, will be a you know, a rival that we'll be uh, very keenly aware of. I'm aware of Lechner. I played against him my freshman year at SC, and I know that he is a very good player, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how well he hold up against Loyola uh, during the latter part of the game when his legs start to get a little bit tired, and uh, I want to see whether or not he can hang with us. I'll be on top of my game, then I'm, I'm really excited about you know us matching up against Wyoming because we lost to them two years ago, and we're a better team now. So, and any team that's ranked above us or the big teams we want so we could we're out to prove you know that we have a really good team Loyola and Wyoming that one at 4 30 we follow that up at 7 o'clock as the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame on St. Patrick's Day face the Mustangs <laughs> of SMU at 7 o'clock then 9 30 from the Midwest Wichita State and DePaul Loyola and Wyoming we've talked about this game it's, who's going to hit 100 first well I think first of all you're looking at run baby run but you're looking at a situation where Loyola hasn't certainly played the quality people that Wyoming has the most underrated conference in America has been the WAC conference you talk about my top five conferences I go number one Big Ten Big East ACC SEC and fifth I'd go with the uh, Big Eight conference but the WAC has been so tough Wyoming Fennis Dembo and all Muhammad Ali cocky and arrogant and he will do it I think they're just too tough for Loyola, who wants to shoot the ball in about six or seven seconds with every possession. Gathers and Kimball can play, they can score, but the question is, I don't think they can stop Wyoming at all. Loyola, you question their schedule. As we said, uh, Oregon State is one team that they have played. The Another one is St. John's. They're the only two teams in the tournament they've played, and they lost to both those teams. Well, in defense of Paul Westhead, who's done a super job since stepping over at Loyola, creating a lot of excitement. They can't get on their schedule all the big boys. See, that's the one the dilemma that exists in a lot of programs. We scream from the media, who do they play? But they don't get a chance to play to people because people say, hey, I don't want to play Loyola unless they're going to come here two for one. We'll play them twice at our place and maybe we'll go once there to see the sun shine. Great game, Wyoming to prevail. Okay, stay with us. Back to the East region in just a moment as we continue from Atlanta on NCAA Tournament today. The Bradley Braves lead at 53-45 to over the Auburn Tigers. Kabor, shot block at five. They had to hustle it up. And Morris has 32 points, a career high. And he has had a career game, and not just scoring either. He sure has. He's run the floor well, played defense, rebounded. How about that guy? Hawkins for three. Give him 44 points. Oh, what a couple of individual performances today. One point game for under two minutes. Are there any two players that can play any better in the country today than these two players that play for their respective teams? I'd love to see them if they could. Moore, forced one up and won't go. Bradley with a chance to regain the lead. Manuel goes down after the contact. No whistle. It's a turnover. And Stan Albeck can't believe it. And now Auburn's going to try to run time off the clock. They're up by one. be patient. They'd love to find Chris Morris inside or Jeff Moore. Shot clock at 21 seconds. That's the game clock on your screen. Look it back out to Howard. Lynn. Down to 10 and they start their offense. Moore. Bradley's ball. Morris goes down hard. Manuel. Two possessions for the Bradley Braves. They have lost the last two possessions, unable to get a shot, and trailing by one point. Here's the pressure. Shot clock's at 38. That's the game clock again on your screen. And it's only a one-point lead. And now Sonny Smith wants to talk to his ball club, and Terrence Howard calls the timeout to set the strategy for the last 42. We'll be back to the Omni in Atlanta in a moment. Barring a miracle, it looks like Missouri for the second straight year will be ousted in the first round. They trail by six at 79-73 in the second half. Fairly Dickinson, it's over now. One and advances 94-79 to is the victory for the Boilermakers. Let's go back to Bradley and Auburn in the southeast in Atlanta. It's been an incredible performance for Hawkins. And
and they'll need him again. Auburn with a one-point lead. Morris fouled by Thomas. That's five on Terry Thomas, the second Bradley inside player to foul out of the ball game. Trimpey will come back in. So the situation now has the shot clock off. Auburn leading by one, and Bradley's offense probably predicated on what happens at these free throws. And you've got a guy at the line that has been there with greater frequency than any other Auburn player. He shot 115 free throws on the year, so it's not like he hasn't been there before. And he's hit eight out of nine today. Big shot there. This one would be even bigger. Would give him a three-point lead. Morris is not moving very well right now, though. You can tell his back is bothering him. He has 33 points on the ball. What a game. Three-point lead, 37 seconds to go. Do you go for the three-point shot? You go to Hawkins. That's where you go. I right now, they'll go to Stan Albeck. I think Stan Albeck wants to, to think about this. He may want to tell him there's one guy that's going to get this ball, and he's wearing 33 on his back. I don't think there's any question that they'll try to free up Hawkins. And knowing Hawkins, he won't force that shot either. He'll give it back to Manuel if he doesn't have it. Go to the other side of the floor. Manuel will take it over, and they'll try to get Hawkins coming out off of that down pick or off of a pick on the block to see if he can get the shot. What will be interesting is to see what Coach Smith does for Auburn defensively. Will he switch up? I mean, at this point, do you take a guy like Chris Morris and put him on Hawkins so that you have the additional size against Hawkins? The other facet of the game, do you foul when the ball comes inbound? Exactly. Bradley shoots a one-and-one. One. They can only get two that way, and Auburn gets the ball back. By the way, during this tournament, the NCAA is conducting research, and we'd like your participation. We'd like to know if you'd like to see more women's basketball on television. If your answer is yes, dial 900-260-2221. If your answer is no, dial 900-260-2222. One other thing about this situation, once I remember years and years ago, with a great score, I saw the coach of the opposing team come out with a triangle and two, and the two were on that score. That just wouldn't let him get the ball. There are a thousand things that can happen, and you know, Sonny Smith plays a lot of zone, and he'll play some gimmick defenses, so we will watch and see what happens, but I think the big decision is do you try and do something defensively against Bradley and Hawkins at this point, or do you commit the foul? Obviously, you do not commit it intentionally, right. but do you commit the foul and give Bradley the one and one get the ball back and still have a one-point lead bradley has three timeouts left auburn only one we're down to 33 seconds to go you couldn't have asked for a better opening round game than the one we have here at the omni in atlanta watch trevor trempy he can shoot the three-pointer and he will shoot it he didn't shoot it well here in the second half he's probably due to hit one manuel is also a very good three-point shooter although he hasn't unloaded he got it's it hawkins to tie he missed it, and Morris with the rebound. Gets it outside to Lynn, but we have a foul underneath. Morris flattened, and Bradley has hit only one of seven three-pointers in the second half. And it's a one-and-one. One. Auburn wanted, of course, the intentional foul. And Morris celebrating with his ball club, maybe a little early. There's 23 seconds left. I wouldn't like the candles on the cake yet. Oh, no, very definitely. This one's not over. Bradley did a good job of setting a double pick and a single pick by Trimpey to get Hawkins the shot. The shot did not go down. Auburn came away with a rebound. Morris with 34 points and 11 out of 12, or 10 of 11, excuse me, from the free throw line, and 12 rebounds has been the star. That is the biggest shot of all. It makes it a four-point lead, and Auburn's going to have to, or Bradley, rather, will have to have the ball twice, at least. Can't say enough of, of, about the ball game that that young man oh. has played and the job that Auburn has done. For Morris again. 12 out of 13, and now Bradley has to hustle and hope. Wilson for three. And now Bradley spends a timeout that cuts the lead down to two points at 88 86 with 16 seconds to go it's not over yet we'll be back in a moment 
when you look through the Aggies a hot basketball team and they turn it over they constructed a 12 to 4 run by hitting six of eight shots but now the orange men have the basketball trailing by two 1917 Ronnie Sykes is not being in the game because of two injuries certainly has enhanced the team's ability to stay in the game and Ronnie's back in now let's see if the big fellas can go to work Rebound a and and sophomore Charles Howard. You know, concentration is such a big part of this game, Bob. And I'm not saying that Ronnie Cyclay and the Syracuse Orange men aren't, aren't concentrated, but sometimes, just sometimes, we think things are going to happen just because. Blocked by Cyclay. Loose ball, and Matt Rose got it. Now, oftentimes, a player, a dunk or a block shot, and gets the team back in it. Let's see if Cyclay's block is going to inspire the Orange men to play a little bit better. Coleman throws it away. Turn for Syracuse. Well, I'm sure Ronnie's blocked it, but just take that turnover. But that's the bugaboo that's haunting Syracuse, and they're going to have to straighten it out, or they're going to keep a &T in this game. And Man. if that happens, anybody could win it. Boy, the longer the underdog stays with a heavily favored team, trouble or blue for the top seed. There's the turnovers for you for each team. 1917 A&T on top. 8-15 to play in the first half. One thing about those 10 turnovers, some of those turnovers for Syracuse were just unforced turnovers. They committed them without any... Carolina A&T Aggies. Boy, they're hanging tough in this one. It's a 31-31 game. The Syracuse Orangemen coming off their win in the Big East tournaments. Expected to be very hot. Right now, we want to move, however, to the Southeast region. We'll be playing in Atlanta. Tennessee Chattanooga hanging tough against Oklahoma and the Sooners. It's 35-24. There you see the clock. 46 seconds left in the first half. Oklahoma... Morris Lyons. What a great move up. Morris Lyons underneath. He reached back for that left handed layup. 37 point lead, I believe. They've got 34 25. With 26 seconds left to happen, Lance Pulse has been called for a personal foul. And welcome those of you watching along ESPN. Pretty good day of first round action across the country, huh? Lance Pulse committing the foul. Good call, Fred. You were right. They didn't give him the two points, and now it's up there. You see Pulse commit the foul just as Stacy King made the move to the basket. Oklahoma in the last five minutes beginning to show us the, the way they played all year long. Getting the ball inside to their two big guns, Grant and King, and moving the ball up the floor very quickly in a good transition game that they dominated the Midwestern part of the country with. They found long. Goes to UT Chattanooga. The mock's down seven. They have now put the two points on the board, as Larry told you. Shandy Moon back in the game. He'll make your all main team for UT Chattanooga. Lions dumps it along the baseline. Shandy Moon back outside to Green. Seven seconds left in the half. Green shot good. Benny Green hits again. Two seconds left in the half. Grace at midcourt lets it fly and doesn't get it. And the moccasins are hanging in against the number one seed in the southeast, Oklahoma. We are at halftime here at the Omni in Atlanta. Oklahoma 34, UT Chattanooga 29. Oklahoma Sooners have opened up the five-point lead. 34-29 to 29 is the score at half. We'll keep in touch with that game. But we want to talk first about our game. Syracuse and the Orangemen having a bit of a problem. They're all tied up at 31 apiece. Ron Cycli, now this is something you want me to talk about. He said when we did the game earlier this season against North Carolina, he would be the number one draft pick this year. Yeah, he maybe will be number one in the CBA. Certainly not number one in the NBA. That's for darn sure. But you mentioned tempo right there. Great tempo job by Don Corbett and North Carolina A&T. But they should be too strong. Hey, what about Coleman? Is he disappearing right now? AWOL didn't score a point in the first half. He's been up and down all year. He's got great potential. But sometimes he comes to play. Sometimes he doesn't. I want to just say this, too. You are rooting for the Hoyas, and I have the Tigers here. The LSU Tigers. Let's hear a hand for the LSU Tigers. They're right now in an audience right here. John Thompson, get your team motivated. Dale Brown said, no chance. We are going to beat the Hoyas. And we will hear from Dale you. Brown a little bit later on today. I am outnumbered. However, I did work in Baltimore for six years, so you forgive me in this one if I'm pulling for the Hoyas. Stay with us. Back with more in just a moment. It's a 31-31 tie. North Carolina A&T hanging with the Syracuse Orange.
ESPN's NCAA basketball. This is the half. Now, the winner of this game will go on to face Rhode Island because we've had our first upset of the tournament. Missouri and the Tigers, Norm Stewart, for the second consecutive year, loses in the first round. Last year it was Xavier. This year to Rhode Island, 87 to 80, and that could set up that Atlantic 10 Big East matchup that the Atlantic 10 has been waiting for for so long. North Texas State and North Carolina, this in the West region, will be played in Salt Lake City. North Texas State came into this game with big dreams, but the dreams are going down quickly. As you can see, the Tar Heels in complete control. Who else do you go to but J.R. Reed fakes out Morgan, and then a nice move as he slips through Reed with 24 points already as North Carolina opened up a 40-24 lead at the half. They now lead it 70-51, to 51, North Carolina and the Tar Heels over North Texas State. In the southeast, in Atlanta, it's Bradley and Auburn, a game you saw earlier here on ESPN. This was our first game. This is a game in which Hersey Hawkins would end his career. End it, however, with 47 points as he really lit things up. But it was too much, or not enough, actually. Right here in the game, Chris Morris with the steal, takes it all the way. Morris had 18 by the half. Now, Hersey Hawkins carried Bradley as he had all year. Hits the jumper here, two of his 47 points points. Braves build up a 14-point lead. Hersey can play defense as well. Watch here as he gets up with the block. Back to the other end. Thomas. Back. And you can see as he puts it home, Bradley led by eight at the half. A major milestone in the second. Three-point play as he's fouled. Hersey Hawkins goes over the 3,000-point mark. Fourth player ever to reach that level. Auburn mounted a comeback. Chris Morris nails the fall away. He had 36 points as he was pretty much matching Hersey Hawkins. Final seconds offered by two. Terrence Howard with the steal. Goes all the way and jams this one home with one second left on the clock. Auburn wins it 90 to 86. Bradley had built up that 14 point lead. Auburn 23 of 27 from the free throw, three free throw rather line. So that was a difference. Oklahoma, Tennessee, Chattanooga winner will play the winner, or rather will play Auburn as they've already beaten Bradley. Now in the Midwest region, it was Memphis State and Baylor. This is a game that is still underway. The winner of this game will go on to play Purdue. Memphis State comes out of the Metro Conference to face Baylor. Baylor out of the Southwest Conference. First half. Watch Rodney Douglas baseline, 360 degrees as he spins around, throws it up, and it does go. The Tigers by three, 33 to 30. That was the score at the half, and that is where we stand right now. The Memphis State Tigers have opened up the lead. Baylor came out and opened up an earlier lead, but Memphis State has the lead at the half. And in South Bend, Indiana, the Midwest, it was fairly Dickinson who drew Purdue. Purdue and the Boilermakers win it going away, 94 to 79. Melvin McCants at 26. Purdue, the Boilermakers out rebounded the Knights 47 to 29. That's the difference. Stay with us. More to come, including more from Dick Vitale in just a moment. Once again, our scores. Are... You can see from the studio, we do have the LSU Tigers on hand to watch us here live and watch Dick Vitale. Many people like to go and watch a basketball game and come out and watch you live. I'm not sure about that. Well, I'll tell you one thing, John. The big question is, are we going to see the real Jose Vargas against Georgetown, uh, the one that played against Oklahoma and was brilliant, or will we see the one that played against, for example, a Mississippi State? They're all laughing right there, but that'll be the key against Georgetown if they can handle Georgetown's pressure. Georgetown, remember the matchup that everybody really out here in the East is searching for. They would like to see, for example, the Syracuse matchup versus Rhode Island, and then Temple against Georgetown because for, for a number of years, the Atlantic Ted's been screaming that we're in the shadow of the Big East. Well, now, finally, they want to get their shot. Tom Penders has said already, Jimmy Beheim, we're waiting. We want Syracuse. We want that shot to play the Big East school. And I'm sure basically the same is holding true. Once Temple gets by, once they get by Lehigh, and I think that's pretty automatic to you. Yeah, I've been wrong before. I would think so. How, something that's Queen interesting. Play. Something that is interesting. Dale Brown might not want to look past Georgetown, and I'm sure John Ooh. Thompson doesn't want to look past LSU, but a lot of people feel the winner out of this game can knock off Temple. Well, I think that's going to be an interesting matchup again for Temple. John Chaney talking to him uh, late last night while he was drinking his cranberry juice. I was drinking mine, and I tell you, I can listen to him all year, all day, all year. He was my choice as coach of the year, and certainly knows that he has a tough test in round two. I think the East is over Overloaded. I thought there wasn't the sufficient balance that should have been. I thought the East is the Mike Tyson region. I told you earlier today, Tony Tubbs is out in the Midwest where Purdue is. That seems to be a lock for Purdue. Back to you, John. They're telling me no more airtime. Imagine that. I, I can't, can't believe, believe it. it. <laughs> Stay with us. There's more to come. You impress me. You pick another coach with Dale Brown right here in the studio as your coach of the year. Stay with us. State 
and Baylor. They're playing in the Midwest Regional, being played in South Bend. This one was a close one at the half. It was 33-30. to 30, But to start the second half, Memphis State, the Tigers came out and reeled off 10 consecutive points, unanswered points, and that's the way it went from there. 33-30. Rodney Douglas with the steal to Elliott Perry. Back to Douglas. Jam time. And that's the way it would go. Tigers big on the boards today. Very aggressive. Watch Dwayne Bailey blow the hawk. But Douglas is there quickly with the rebound and the score. Larry Fix loves what he's seeing at that point, and why not? 75 to 60 is the way this one would wind up. Memphis State, the Tigers, with the win over Baylor. Baylor out of the Southwest Conference. They'll face Purdue next. Now, how do you like that matchup? The Purdue Boilermakers against the Memphis State Tigers. Memphis State, they lost two guys early in the year, but they've been playing tough just the same. I think you've got to give a lot of credit to Larry Finch. I think he's done an amazing job. How many guys can lose a guy like they lost in Marvin Alexander, the big wide body, and then also lose Sylvester Gray, who I thought was one of the diaper dandies in America last year, and still hang tough and get him to the NCAA? Uh, Elliot Perry, I really like him. I like Larry Finch. I'll tell you one thing down in Memphis. Lock him up for a long, long time because he is a good one. And remember this, if Day John would have had Vincent Askew, yes. who made the major mistake to go to the draft and get drafted by Philadelphia, and today he's not playing in the NBA, do you hear me, guys like Coleman and Lane? Don't take that road. You're not ready for life in the NBA. If they had Askew, Alexander, and Gray, I really believe you're looking at one of my choices. Could have been, should have been, and would have been for Memphis State a Final Four team. Is it a Final Four team? Purdue is a team that many no, people if think. No, they had all those guys. No, I realize they don't have them now. But Purdue still could strong. knock off Purdue. It's early on right now. Loyola and Wyoming, a game coming your way next. That one, Loyola and Wyoming, will be a run and gun. Loyola, the Marymount team, the Lions, the top scoring team in the nation, and that's a game... Yes, Dick, we'll give you a chance to talk about that in just a moment. But first of all, the North Carolina Tar Heels face North Texas State. North Texas State with dreams of knocking off the Tar Heels, but those dreams have been shattered already early on in this tournament. Dean Smith's crew comes away with the victory here. Understandably nervous. Jeff Lebo, defense helps force it. Ranzino Smith takes it in for the easy two. 21-8 Tar Heels. J.R. Reed gave a clinic in the paint. Reed with a jump hook in the lane. Eagles coach Jimmy Gales needs a drink of water at this point. 40 to 24, North Carolina. Second half, Reed displays some more of his moves inside. He finished with 29. Carolina by 23. Dean Smith let everyone get in on the fun. Scott Williams with a partial block gets the rebound. Ahead to King Rice. Ahead to Steve Bucknoff on the Tar Heels cruise to the 83 to 65 win. And this one over North Texas State. J.R. Reed, the super sophomore, had another super day. 29 points and nine rebounds. They'll play the winner of our next game, which is Loyola and Wyoming. Ted Robinson, after the game, had a chance to speak to J.R. Reed. I'm J.R. Reed with 29 points. Uh, your overall feelings about the game today, J.R.? I think we played pretty well, in, except for the last few minutes of the second half. Um, I think we have to cut down our turnovers if we want to be successful in this tournament. You've been tough inside. Uh, you and Williams, uh, that was a factor. You had a little size advantage over the North Texas Mean Green. Uh, you took advantage of it earlier, then maybe you got away from it and started going outside. Do you feel uh, you went back inside the second half? Was that a factor? I think so. That's our philosophy here at Carolina is to get the ball inside first, and I think good things come from that. If we're not open, we're going to kick it out to Jeff Lee, Bo, Renzino Smith, or Kevin Madden for a three-point shot. I think today we put a great all-around effort, and um, guys just really played hard, and we were able to come out with a victory. Come out with a victory. They did indeed. J.R. Reed with his 29 points. J.R. Reed, is there any question that he's taken over as the top paint man in the game? Well, he's a big dominator inside. If I had to go my All-American team for next year, you ready? Let's excite people for next year. Sherman Douglas would be my point guard. Rex Chapman, my second guard. Mark Macon, i got to wait another year. Up front, I'll go with Danny Ferry. I love the all-around game of Ferry from out of Duke. Middle, J.R. Reed. Small forward, my favorite this year. Next year, Sean Elliott, who will stay at school at Arizona. Not a bad five. Not a bad five at all. Always trying to get a jump on the rest of the guys <laughs> in this one. You're picking your, your best team. You're all Americans at this point in the season. We're still not done with this year next. Our next game, of course, is from the West. It's Wyoming and Loyola in a game, as we said, that promises to be one where they'll run and gun. From the opening buzzer, let's go for a preview to Frank Fallon and Irv Brown. Thank you, John. I'm Frank Fallon with Irv Brown, and we are here at the John Hunt. Oh, out in there, maroon trimmed in blue. This is Dembo working against Hank Gathers. Loyola will really jump you now. This is the game right here. That's it. And the big 6'11", 265-pound center gets the first two points of the ball game. Look how fast Loyola comes down. We want to keep track how quick they shoot it. This is a record. They've used seven seconds. 
They sometimes get it away within two. There is the first two quarter of the ball game for Loyola. Mark Armstrong, who's a pretty unlikely scorer, he only averages 7.2 per ball game. He's more of a rebounder than he is a scorer. We're tied at two. Bet on one thing. A guy named Sean Dent will be in here soon. Benny Deasy is very superstitious as we have the foul. He won't start Sean Dent, but uh, his uh, quip was, you'll see him before home of the Brave is played. Sean Dent can handle the press. Mark Armstrong, number five, picking up the foul for LMU. The Lions are averaging 110.4, but they're giving up 95 per ball game. You know, it's like a guy who swings the bat in baseball. He's dangerous. And Paul Westhead will just flat tell you, if we get up between 80 and 100, if you can beat us, so be it. Well, here's a fellow who is from a city that's only a stone's throw from the Marinoff campus, Eric Lechner, who is from Manhattan Beach, California. And he now has three points. It's three to two in favor of Wyoming. Frank, this guy's got a great pair of hands. He can play with his back to the basket. They'll front him today with no backside help. What they'll try and do is jump him up right. Here comes a numbered break every time. Corey Gaines. Took him about two seconds to take that one from coast to coast. Transfer from UCLA, and he was the good one there until Pooh Richardson showed up on that NIT champion. We played one minute with eight points on the scoreboard, equally divided between LMU and Wyoming. 4-4, this is Dembo, working against Gathers. Look at him in front of him, there's no chance. He has all for Wyoming's first point. He could go for 40 today. All right, now I'll tell you what happened. Now I'll tell you why Westhead is so upset. A Wyoming kid put his hand on the basketball. They can't play, Tom by Loyola, if the officials permit him to do that. They've got to leave the basketball alone or it'll kill Westhead's offense. This is Corey Gaines. Slipping and falling for a moment was Reggie Fox. With 50 seconds to play. Bo Kimball with an easy layup. That should do it. Had a breath until Bo makes one. Now then, as the foul is committed, Loyola Marymount has a chance to set that individual team record. We mentioned earlier that it was 113 by North Carolina last year. The most points ever scored in a first or second round game. And right now, Loyola has the 113 with 38 seconds, and they're at the strike. That game for the Lions, number 32, Enoch Simmons. Five fouls. And let's see who came back in for Wyoming. Kurt Samuels, number 11, is in the ballgame now for the Cowboys. So Benny, uh, give Rod Tyson also in for Wyoming. Tyson's from Laramie. Mike Yost, who has shot 12 free throws today and made 10 of them. That breaks the record. So the record established by the team that they will play next if they hold on to win this one. North Carolina, 114, the most points ever scored in an NCAA first or second round game. Make it 115 to 106. Tyson gets his own missed shot. Gets a three. Did a good job. Let's see if they can hammer quickly. It's not impossible. Two three-pointers. That's an intentional, intentional foul. foul. And the rule is simply this. You get the shots and the ball out of bounds. So Clausel Williams committing the intentional foul will give Marymount two shots plus the ball. Well, the folks across the country watching this one today can say they've seen the highest scoring game in NCAA first or second round history, 115 to 109. And Loyola Marymount bidding fair to win its 25th game in a row. 32 fouls against Wyoming, 22 against Loyola Marymount. Yost has shot 15 free throws and has made all but two of them. 16 and has made 14 of them. Boy, is he intelligent. He knows how to play. He had a couple moves today that were big league. 26 points for Mike Yost. The last time Wyoming lost was over here in this state. They lost at Provo against BYU. 26 seconds to play. Clausel Williams for three. Well, they haven't quit. Oh, they sure haven't. It's a five-point lead. Fryer across the timeline. But time is running out. 
And it'll be a two shot foul. Oh, one and one. One and one. Two fouls on Davis. Robin Davis commits the foul. Penny D's had an outstanding year no matter how this one comes out and doesn't look very good from right now the 26 games are the most ever won by a cowboy team they started out and they won 13 in a row then lost two down in albuquerque and el paso one of the meanest swings in america lost at home to byu the program was at its lowest ebb lost at csu in fort collins then back they came strong won 13 or 14 and ran into a buzzsaw today Fryer, who has now scored 16 points off the Loyola bench. And with six seconds to go, it's 119 to 112. Well, the, uh, the Lions now have upped their average to over 110.5. So they now officially are the highest scoring team in college basketball history for this season. Three pointer by Brazil Williams. That wraps it up 119 to 115. So Loyola Marymount scoring 119 to Wyoming's 115 will move on to play North Carolina on Saturday. Winning this one by four and being sparked by Bo Kimball who wound up with 29 points. 119 to 115 will be back. Here at the Huntsman. Record performance in Dick Vitale, a team that has scores now, as, as Frank mentioned near the end of the game, uh, more points than any team right now on average. One shot deal, you can do it, allowing your opposition to shoot over 50%. And their defense on the year, 54% for the opposition, you can beat a one shot deal. And that's what they did tonight. Yeah, they really did. They rose to the occasion, Bob, and beat a good Wyoming basketball team, played brilliantly. I love their second effort and their hustle, but what a. I mean, I can't get over that running game they have, the way they shoot the ball so quickly and they score, and Paul Westhead's got to feel like a million dollars. And what about Kimball and Gathers? Do you think they would like to have uh, them over at the University of Southern Cal? Gosh, they passed less than you did when you used to play. A reminder, coming play, along. I never play. Yeah, you were some kind of a player. Notre Dame and SMU, top of the hour at 7 Eastern time, and coming along at 9 Eastern time tonight, we'll have the presentation of the Naismith Trophy and the announcement of the Naismith All-American teams in our second primary game in prime time tonight at 9.30 Eastern time, Wichita State and DePaul. We, of course, will have live reports and cut-ins and switchabouts all throughout the evening, wherever the action is happening. What a day we've had so far. We've got uh, some basketball to show you and talk about. Final score, it was a record performance, 119-115, Loyola. NCAA tournament tonight. We've got SMU and Notre Dame at the top of the hour. We've had surprises today. Wouldn't be the first round without our ration of surprises, such as the game between Rhode Island and Missouri. Played today, and uh, this one really in Chapel Hill gave us a good idea that URI could be a factor. Mergen Cena here to reserve Kenny Green for the jam. Green had 14 off the bench. Derek Chivas, though, the Band Aid man. Byron Irvin with the rejection on Carlton Owens. Chivas puts it through. Tigers up by a deuce of the half. Now, Chivas at 35 on the game gets past Cena here. But it really was a one man show for Missouri, that one man being Derek Chivas. The Rams were clicking on all cylinders. Carlton Owens picks it away from Byron Irvin. Silk Owens at 25 on the day. And then Tom Garrick, he did a did he ever in the second half, pushes aside Irvin and sticks the J. Garrick at 29 points, 25 of those in the second half. That's the game clock with the Rams up by seven. Garrick with a major basket, the final 87 to 80. First win ever in the tournament for Rhode Island, the third straight tournament time that Missouri has gone out in the first round. Garrick had 29 points, as we said, most of those in the second half. He was the hero of today's game. I felt that I had to put the ball in the second half. See that? I think opposite of a lot of plays. If they think if they're cold, they're going to stop shooting. I think if I'm cold, I have to keep on shooting and get hot. Eventually, something's going to drop. And if I don't shoot on this team, uh, because me and Carlton put up a lot of the points, I have to shoot to create things for other people. Even if I'm cold, if, once I pull up, if I'm not hitting, if I can dump off, people are going to start be attracted to me, and it's going to open things up for everyone else. Tom Garrick of Rhode Island, and uh, URI moves on. It was not easy for Syracuse in the other game this afternoon at Chapel Hill. The win over NCANT, 69-55. Stevie Thompson had 21, but one had counted. It was a one-man show for Syracuse. Ronnie Sykley, 16 boards and 20 points. We continue looking towards the top of the hour as our coverage continues in the first round. Nick Vital and Bob Lee will continue on the NCAA tournament tonight. When this time of the year rolls around, Looks like an intense business, but he's not too intense right now as he joins us live in the studio. And uh, Dale, thanks for joining us. What's the state of your ball club right now? 
Well, I hope good. We've, uh, it's been a tough week, and I think they're extremely tough emotionally. Uh, to get through Don Redden, we've gone through the Pete Maravich thing, uh, two just unbelievable deaths. I just like them. I like the feeling. And I, I just pray that Punches Pilot, Dick Vitale, will please, <laughs> dear God, please let Dick Vitale Come on, now, don't start say already, LSU you? is going to lose. Bob, uh, now, you know he wears you out working with oh, him. Oh, without a doubt. This man has never predicted LSU to win an NCAA tournament game in two years. God, please let this luck continue <laughs> because he's picking Georgetown, so we may have a chance. Well, the reason i got to pick Georgetown, first of all, you got to give the edge to John Thompson on the sideline <laughs> as a coach. Hey, he's seriously. A Rolls -Royce, Wait, right? He's a Rolls Royce, He's a Rolls but seriously, now, you're one of my old wackos. We but, named a team, Bob. We well, named a I team. I can't even ask the guy a question. The all Rolls Royce. I'm going to leave. I'm we, leaving. We named an all Rolls Royce announcers. Uh-oh. Uh Dick Vitale didn't make it. Uh -oh. You did, Bob. Uh -oh. Jim Brando made it, and you made it. Well, Brando's but... in your coattails all the time down there in Baton Rouge. Let me ask you a right. question, all will right. you please? Right. Number one, you had to be shocked and surprised that you got in the tournament at 16 and 13. I wasn't shocked or surprised. I was elated uh, because of the schedule, the power schedule. No one said anything. No one came on the air and said anything the year, Dick. We were second in the Southeastern Conference with a 10-8 record didn't go to an NCAA tournament, and I didn't say anything to chastise the NCAA because I believe in the selection committee, and I really do. I think they're a, a, a gutty group of guys that are trying to do their best. No matter what they do, it's like coaching. Be damned if you do and damned if you don't. Bob, next Wednesday, would you do me a favor? All would right. you reserve it? I have a chance to All go right. to Detroit, Michigan to roast Dick Vitale. Now, as guests, I've already invited Himmler, Joseph Goebbels, uh, you know, all of them. I've got them all. Uh, if, if you want to come, you can come. All right. It'll be a great roast. Let me, let me ask you a question <laughs> about the East. Is the East overloaded? When you took a, uh, happy to get in, you look at that Eastern bracket. It looks it's like it's top heavy, one. isn't it? Yeah, it looks like a, it looks like a great bracket. And and again, if you if you talk about talk about tournament experience, just the two that are playing, Georgetown, LSU, Temple, uh, it, it's really a great bracket. It probably the best one in the country. Have you? basically run into one of your favorite coaches since he's in the East also by the name of General Robert Montgomery Knight? <laughs> You're looking forward to that uh, matchup? I will pay no, to be on courtside to watch the two of you play. Listen, they say that silence is a lie, and at the same token, my mother told me never to lie, tell the truth. Now, she only had an eighth grade education, but I think had she gone to the ninth grade, she might have told Motor Mouth or myself, who talks too much, um, that sometimes maybe silence is the best had she had a ninth grade education i was trying to make a point the point was very simple none of us own this game none of us are god i can't point my finger at another human being but i can point my finger when someone is not treated equally i've been in the business 31 years uh, dick and bob i've never gotten a technical in 31 years that either my big mouth didn't i deserve or my immature actions and uh, all of us try to intimidate officials, but none of us should be put above. I don't have hatred to anybody. I got it out of my system. I'd like it to die. Uh, it's over. Uh, enough said on that issue. I got, me, I got, got one question. We've talked about a lot of things over the years. You've been outspoken about the NCAA. Have things gotten better? Look back to 85. Oh. The college presidents got involved. Do you see an improvement? I, for the first time in my life, and I applaud Dick Schultz. He's one of us. He's yeah, been he's in the arena. He's the doggone guy's been a coach. He's been an athletic director. He's honest. Right. I, for the first time, have faith in the NCAA. I'm going to do everything in my power to help Dick Schultz. Yeah, you people. used to call the NCAA office, and you know... I thought, well, excuse me, I thought I called the Kremlin by mistake, you know, it was like, well, geez, what are you bothering us for? It's not that way now. There's some great people there. They've gotten rid of a few. They may maybe need to get rid of a few. Dick Schultz is our salvation, NCAA. I want to change the subject because I know there's some good news. I know you might not be able to <laughs> announce this, but I know you're elated. See, at breakfast uh, this morning, I clutch you. I clutch you. You're on the phone, and there's some great news. Uh, LSU will get the talents of Maurice Williamson. Uh, His, I guess, daddy was John, who was a great player, he's from out of New Haven, Connecticut, 38 points a game. You have Stanley Roberts next year, Woodrow. They tell me you're going to get Chris Jackson, unbelievable talent. Hey, next year, see, you're relaxed right now. Nobody's expecting you to be here. Next year, all the expectations, LSU. You getting what's, Williamson? Are you getting you Williamson on your shoulders now, what's right? You Are you no. getting Williamson? I, I, I can't comment because of rules, uh, but they I'll have tell you Williamson. What, this guy should have been a CIA, a KGB, <laughs> yeah. FBI, IRS. IRS. Should we talk about the no, IRS no, with the no, money no. he's making or not? Let's, huh? us, let's ponder that for a second. He's got a few things to talk about. We're standing by top of the hour for the game between us.
two weeks from now, the top teams meet in the middle of the country, Kansas City, where the first Final Four convened 50 years ago, the city where the most titles have been decided. 291 teams began this quest, 64 have gotten this far. No second chances, no appeal, just the simple chance to win, keep winning, and end up in a golden Final Four. NCAA basketball. Our first round coverage continues. Notre Dame, SMU. David Rivers, the epitome of courage. A story off told. His play is the principal reason the Fighting Irish take the floor tonight in the field of 64. And they do it on St. Patrick's Day. Could it be a Gaelic convergence? Mustangs don't usually worry about things like that. Southern Methodist, the champion of the Southwest Conference. Basketball, the only show now on their campus. Tonight, can the guys from Big D rack up a W? We'll see. Second game, DePaul and Wichita State. Joey Myers had some tournament success in recent years, and his team is on a roll. The streaking Blue Demons enjoy some unconscious play of late from Stanley Brundy, who has truly put the pedal to the metal. And then there's guard Rod Strickland. When he is on, he controls a game. Wichita's Eddie Fogler rolled up his sleeves, and in his second year, the Shockers a strong second in the Missouri Valley Conference. How strong is that? We'll see. Two primary games, live reports from all over the country on ESPN's ninth year of the tournament. And welcome, ESPN's NCAA Tournament tonight. I'm Bob Lee, along with Dick Vitale. We will be here throughout the entire evening. If you are just joining us, you have missed a wild afternoon full of some surprises, as you might expect. We'll be recapping it through the day. We're about to send you to the SMU Notre Dame game. Also beginning at this time at 7 Eastern time, the games between BYU and UNC Charlotte, and the game of the Midwest and South Bend between Kansas State and LaSalle. And of course, we will be taking you wherever the action is hottest with scores and highlights throughout the night. We're going to the Dean Dome. We'll do well, it. It means right a now. lot. I'll tell you right now, I would want to play Notre Dame. David Rivers, will this be his last game? What a great career he's had. What a difference he has made. And of course, the story of his courage. Bob Rathman, Dan Bonner on our primary game. We'll have reports from around the country. As the evening gets revved up, it's tournament time. Let's go to Chapel Hill. NCAA East Region Chapel. Pretty good movement of both the basketball as well as the personnel from UNC Charlotte, ending up with a good shot from Byron Dinkins. Dinkins, who averaged just 21 and a half points a game, has five. And everybody has participated in this run. Six players already in the scoring count. Chapman, little jump hook, and he is so tough down low, he's got eight. You have to force him out on the floor and not allow him to play with his back to the basket. That's his game. Look at Michael Smith up over on the other side of the floor in front of his BYU bench lead and shooters. Some of the broadcasters behind him asking him to sit down. At 6'9", he takes up a lot of space over there. Cedric Ball with the follow. The 49ers are doing a number. We will track this one. Charlotte up 31 to 19. Now let's get you back to the Dean Dome. SMU and Notre Dame with Bob Rathman and Dan Bonner. Gentlemen. Richmond is an outstanding player. He's certainly one of my Juco jammers, who's one of the best junior college players in America and will be an NBA first-round selection. Lionel Simmons, Larry Brown had him last year in an all-star uh, uh, team and said that he was by far the best player he had, and Simmons is just a great talent, a tremendous number three player. Interesting story developing out of Kansas State. All right. Lonnie Kruger has done a fantastic job replacing Jack Hartman. They've built a new arena. Question I have, will Lonnie Kruger say bye-bye to Kansas State and go to Texas. Another name being bandied around, Eddie Fogler. Eddie Fogler is going to be a hot item from out of Wichita State. And an out, I'm going to tell you an outside choice. He may be ready to leave Purdue this year. Oh, really? Watch Gene Cady's name. He is close with the athletic director. Cady is going to be one of the rising names all over America.
could probably have a lot of jobs. Can you win big at basketball at Texas? Do you really think so? That's a football school, probably the greatest disparity in the country between the two programs as far as attention given to it. I disagree with that. I think All I right. got a great facility down in Austin, a beautiful city. I think it's a great program that can be, I think it can be made into a, it's a great athletic program that can be made into a great basketball program. I think you can win big. Maybe I'll send my resume. Please, please. I'm undefeated. I'll, I'll, I'll give I you the stamp. I will give you the stamp to do that. I haven't lost a game in nine All years right. on TV. We've got a one-point game, SMU on top at the half. We're also watching K-State leading LaSalle at halftime and Charlotte working on a surprise at BYU. We continue with the NCAA tournament tonight. ESPN. 80-78. UNC Charlotte with the basketball down by two. A minute three left in the game. This is Dinkins. He'll go one-on-one -on -one against Hawes. Now to West. Missed it, but he'll get the two free throws, and West, an excellent free throw shooter. It appeared that Dinkins was going to try to be extremely creative and get the shot for himself, but he gave it up to West, and West made a good move right there. Came to the inside. He's left-handed, went up to shoot the jumper. Oh, Taylor really kind of whacking the chops for his trouble. And you're going to get the foul when you're on the side like Brian Taylor was there. West is hit three out of four. Big shot, and he missed it. He'll get one more. 56 seconds left, so Brigham Young won't be able to hold the ball. Call is in, and Yusevich goes out, so a very small lineup out there right now. Well, Coach Liddell Anderson is going to protect the basketball. He wants good ball handlers and his best free throw shooters in there right now. West cut the lead to one. See how much time BYU can work off the clock. Pause. And he's got Barnes on him. And now Brigham Young will go for the timeout with 42 seconds to go in the game, up by one. It looked like one official had a five-second violation while the other one called a timeout. So we have that question of what exactly the call was. 42 seconds to go. BYU has the one-point lead. Mustangs of SMU have the lead on top of Notre Dame. It is St. Patrick's night. Bob Rathbun and Dan Bonner, where do we stand? The Mustangs Final minute of this game now in the Dean Dome. With the basketball, leading seven and a minute four left. Stevenson knocked it out of bounds, so SMU will maintain possession. I think what Stevenson was actually trying to do was to foul Terry Thomas, number 23 in white because he's the worst free throw shooter and now McKinney makes a mistake and he travels with the basketball. When Stevenson knocked the ball out of bounds, it became a spot throw in, which means McKinney's got to stay on the spot and he forgot and he moved with the ball. So it's a turnover. And a break for Notre Dame. A minute two left, the Irish trailing by seven. Stevenson going up. And a foul on SMU. If that foul's on Alexander, he may be out of the ball here. It's on Vernon Perdue. It's his second. But the Irish in the bonus with 58 seconds left. It was interesting. Mark Stevenson had a good shot at the basket, but he elected to try to penetrate down inside, draw a possible foul, and score the basket to try for a three-point play. 58 seconds left and a timeout on the floor here in Chapel Hill. Like to Tight one happening. BYU and UNC Charlotte. Let's get to Atlanta. Mike Patrick and Bob Ortigle. We've got 42 seconds to go in a one-point game. BYU on top. Carolina Charlotte trying to get his team fired up, and there's Liddell Anderson of Brigham Young. 31 seconds to go on the shot clock. 42 in the game. So BYU cannot just run out the clock. I thought Michael Smith had a message for you there, Mike Patrick. <laughs> I hope not. He's too big to be giving me messages. <laughs> Smith right on his average with 21 points. See if they go to him for the last shot as the shot clock winds down. And the foul on Dinkins, and that's his fifth. Oh, 
Holy cow, he went for the ball. Dinkins went for the steal right there. And that will be very, very costly to UNC Charlotte. He's the key to their basketball team. You see him go for it right there. There wasn't a lot of contact. The official standing right there made the call immediately. Every time that he has been out of the basketball game, number four, Byron Dinkins right there. Every time he's been out here tonight, BYU has benefited tremendously. One time they came from behind and took the lead. The next time they increased the lead by six points. The player of the year in the Sun Belt Conference, number four, has just fouled out the UNC. Standing Charlotte. ovation for Dinkins, 21 points. And now you have to wonder where the ball will go when UNC Charlotte comes back down the court. Right now they're down by one. Brigham Young has shot 75% from the line. Taylor, who is an 87% free throw shooter, on a big one and one. <laughs> Nothing but net. That is a big one, and as we mentioned, this is a very fine free throw shooting team. The interesting, back in. the interesting to see right now, Mike, if BYU comes with that full court pressure if Brian Taylor makes this free throw because that's what they have been doing throughout the course of the game. It could create problems for UNC Charlotte with Dinkins on the bench. If he makes this shot, it's a three-point lead, and you've got to look for Jeff West, their only legitimate three-point shooter. And they do not apply the pressure. They move into the backcourt. 82-79, and Jeff Mullins wants to set strategy for the final 24 seconds with his club. Dinkins is on the bench. This one is going right down to crunch time. Back now to SMU and Notre Dame. That's the game clock. Bob Rathbun and Dan Bonner. Vernon Purdue of SMU just missed the front end of a one and one. SMU got the rebound and Notre Dame is fouled again. So SMU to the line with 48 seconds left and Dave Bliss's team leading 76 to 71. And Cato Armstrong, who has scored a game high 28, is on the line. And that miss by Vernon Purdue from the free throw line was really a bad break for Notre Dame. That ball barely touched the iron, came straight down. The inside people for Notre Dame, Bose and Stevenson, didn't have a chance to get their hands up to try to get the ball. Armstrong hits them both. 78-71 SMU. 45 seconds left right now. Frederick for three. Too long. Jackson puts it in. SMU, or rather, Notre Dame has only one timeout left. They don't use it. Here's the breakaway, and McKinney to James. And that probably does it for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. McKinney just running long. Good pass by Purdue. Stevenson scores. And you notice nobody from SMU is trying to block any of those shots. They don't want to create any three-point opportunity. 14 seconds. Purdue. And a foul on Frederick. Nice job by SMU moving the basketball. Notre Dame couldn't catch up with anybody to foul. So the Irish are going down to defeat on St. Patrick's night. All right, 24 seconds to go. We're in Atlanta. UNC Charlotte down by three. They've got the ball. I'd like to welcome the viewers at ESPN. Came back at a good time. 24 seconds to go. UNCC down by three. Let's see if they get it to West. This is Barnes. BYU with a foul to give, Mike. As you mentioned, they get the ball back. And they throw it away. Let's see. It's a backcourt violation. UNCC will get the ball back. And Reggie Barnes' heart must be up in his throat because he just telegraphed the pass and gave the ball to BYU. Yes, he really did, and it just points out again the importance of not having Dinkins in the game because yeah. he's on the bench with foul trouble. He's out, as a matter of fact. See if they can run West. It's Pursley for three. West has it. He's got to come out the three-point range. Smith is on him. The basket will not count. 45 goal, goal timeout. And they said the 49ers got a timeout with six seconds left. Holy cow. 82.79. We'll be back in a moment. Holy cow! You sound like a poet, Mike. 
Patrick West is the best, and he drains it. Holy cow. You ought to go back to the hotel and write a poem after this one. at it again. West works toward the baseline, gets it, goes up. There is no contact made by Brian Taylor. Look at this young man. He's younger right now, I'll tell you that, Jeff Mullins. There's a guy in his day hit a few of those. There's that low angle look at Jeff West hitting that big jumper. We've got a tie basketball game with two seconds to go. Now BYU can get it in and get a shot off. That's the good news for the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. The bad news is that Dinkins has fouled out of the ball game. So if we do go to overtime, they will not have their star. But they'll take what they can get right now. Right now, they'll take an overtime if they can get into it. But this ball game's not over yet with two seconds to play. BYU will probably try to throw the basketball the length of the floor. You do not want it to go out of bounds because North Carolina, North Carolina Charlotte would get it back out of bounds underneath their own basket if it was not touched. But I think the 49ers have to extend, put pressure on defensively so that the BYU player that takes the inbounds pass cannot get a shot off, at least cannot get it off without defensive pressure there. West has made three of five three-pointers tonight. That's the biggest one it probably ever made. Smith will be the inbound. Jeff Mullins, the coach for North Carolina Charlotte. Left Al Anderson for BYU on his feet. There's a good look at Coach Anderson. Smith, the long, long pass picked off. And everybody just stood there and waited for the buzzer. There was a real hesitation, I think, from the time that the ball was touched in bounds and the clock was started. We'll be back for overtime in the opening round of the NCAA in a moment. The shot by Jeff West, six foot two inch junior from Bermuda Run, North Carolina. That tied the game. We're going overtime. We'll be updating that game, of course. Now, SMU, that final score, 83-75, as the Mustangs move on now in the East. And for the first time since 1983, the Fighting Irish lose a basketball game on St. Patrick's Day. They lost that year, 83, in the National Invitation Tournament. Final on that Kansas State game, final was 66-53. K-State now moves along with a record of 23-8. So we are standing by at the bottom of the hour for DePaul and Wichita State, keeping a close eye on the OT in Atlanta with... Charlotte in action, of course, against BYU. We continue with our coverage right after this. Bottom of these 30 minutes for the game between DePaul and Wichita State. From the Midwest region coming along about 9.30 Eastern Time, Georgia Tech head coach Bobby Cremens will be joining us live in the studio during the course of these 30 minutes. And also the live presentation of the Naismith Award to the top men's basketball player in the country as voted by the Atlanta Tip-Off Club. And we've got overtime in Atlanta. BYU in the white. Charlotte in the tan. Let's get back to the game now in OT, Mike Patrick. Momentum is a funny thing. You'd think the way that UNC Charlotte timed up, they'd have it in the overtime. But six straight points for Brigham Young has the Cougars up 88-82. And the right-handed Michael Smith goes to the yep. baseline and takes the shot with his left hand and gets it done. He has 23 the game's leading scorers. Quite a play. Ball against Houston. It's offensive foul. And Yusevich has fouled. Second. UNC Charlotte to really back off a little bit. They can't do that right now. Took some of the starch out. 308 left in the game. Ball's doing a good job working on the clock. Down to three minutes. Use of it. Taylor. Guarded by Barnes. Shot box at 17. Yusevich has to go get it with 10 seconds on the shot clock. Pause with a runner. And Brigham Young's ball. Taylor makes the wise decision. They bring it back out, get a new 45. And the important thing about that exchange is the new 45 seconds. 
Attributed to the fact that Dinkins is on the bench and they had to start that overtime without him. West for three. 90-85. They better get the basketball to that young man. He's really their only legitimate outside threat. And he's also an excellent free throw shooter, so either way you look at it. You have a good thing going when West has the ball for UNC Charlotte, but they need the ball back right now before they can get it to it. When does it reach the point you have to foul? Well, they're down five points right now. I, I don't think they have to foul yet. Smith with the running hook! 25 for Michael Smith! Last time he had the left-handed jumper. This time he has the right-handed hook. West with the runner get it to fall, but he will get the foul out of it. That could have been another three-point play. That's what I mentioned, Mike. They really have to get the ball to West. Here's Smith at the other end of the floor. Gathers himself just before he took that hook. Great control. He shot it very well. We see it again a second time at a low angle. He is excited. He should be excited. He's hit him from just about every area. Nathan Call will come back in the game. Taylor goes out. Pulley is in number 22 for UNC Charlotte. West with 18 points. He's hit four or six free throws. He made a lot of big points. He had the three-pointer to put it in overtime. He had the three-pointer the last time down the floor. Now he comes away with a couple of huge free throws. 92-87, and the 49ers need a steal desperately. And they go to pressure. We haven't seen that full-court pressure a great deal in this basketball game. Persley on Smith, who was also an excellent ball handler. Isn't there anything this guy can't do? 112 to go in the game. Five point lead. BYU running time off that clock. Shot clock is down to 14 seconds. Nathan Call gets it out to Smith. Shot clock's at nine. Smith against Persley. Oh, what a shot by Michael Smith. Holy cow, he's got 27, six in overtime. And all six of them, difficult shots that he made look just very easy. Three-pointer by Blonte. Cuts it to 94-90. That is the first three-pointer Dan Plunkey has made this season. He picked the right time, didn't he, Mike? And you know Overtime continues apace. We'll be finishing this game and also having a live conversation with Georgia Tech head coach Bobby Cremins and live presentation of the Naismith Trophy. Then we've got DePaul Wichita State. We've got a big evening. Let's get back now. Final moments of the overtime at the Omni, BYU, and UNC Charlotte, Mike Patrick. 30 seconds left, 94-90. And Brigham Young will have the basketball as we resume action. Michael Smith on the night, 27 points on 11 out of 17 shooting from the floor. 12 rebounds. And he has hit, Bob Ortical, the clutch shots down the stretch. Absolutely no question about it. He had a great move on the baseline on the right side of the floor and made a left-handed jumper. He's right-handed. He then had a hook shot coming across the lane with the right hand, and then he hit a double pump jumper from the left side of the floor. So he's he's just been all over the place, and he brought the ball up the floor against the pressure. I think we've seen his entire act tonight, and I like it. And here's the foul as Flonky reaches in, commits the personal, and UNC Charlotte right now reduced to doing this and doing it as quickly as they can. That only cost him two seconds on the clock, but Brigham Young, all year has been one of the top 10 teams in the nation in free throw shooting. And there aren't many weak links in this group. You look down their free throw percentages from a coaching standpoint before you go in and in my preparation for the basketball game so I can determine who you might foul on that BYU team. And I'm sure the opposing coach did the same. And, and there's, there's no one there. I'd foul you. I'd come over and foul you. I want you put you at the line. Well, that'd be the right, that'd be the right choice. <laughs> 
first time you've agreed with me all day. Pause at the line. This is a one-and-one one big shot. Makes it a five-point lead, and Hawes has hit seven out of eight. Yusevich will come back in. Nathan Paul will go to Liddell Anderson's bench. BYU does not want to commit a foul at this point. They do not want to stop the clock. And I would think that UNC Charlie would like to get the ball down the floor quickly and get it in the hands of West, number 11. Boy, Marty Hawes just doesn't care. He'll make anything. Pursley for three. Pursley has it back, leans in. He's fouled by Smith. Pursley did get the three-pointer outside, but he had to shoot it against some pretty good pressure. There's that loose ball right there that hits the floor. Going after it for BYU, number 24, Jeff Chapman, his teammate, number four, with his hand up. Michael Smith, certainly the outstanding player here in the overtime. Well, those are dangerous fouls, too. If the ball goes in, it's a chance for a three-point play. The last thing you want to give them. That's right. Pursley at the line where he shot 80% this year, has 11 points in the game. That's right on his average. Short, short. And way short on that one. It's a six-point lead. One thing you don't want to do here is pull a string. Never up, never in. Short again. They keep it alive, though. Tip it outside. There's nobody there except Taylor. And Taylor trying to run the clock, had it knocked out. And it's out to UNC Charlotte. Taylor elected to pull back. And when he did to turn around, he lost the basketball out of bounds. Bully gets it to West for three. Smith with a rebound, and he is clobbered by Pulley with three seconds to go. And that'll do it. Michael Smith made all the big plays for BYU in the five-minute overtime. Didn't he ever? He had the big baskets. He was all over the backboards. He handled the basketball against pressure. He took the ball out of bounds against that pressure, got it in bounds, and they gave it back to him. It's really a shame for the 49ers of Jeff Mullins that Dinkins fouled out in regulation. Certainly, we saw every time he was in there what a lift he gave to every other player on the court. And left with 21 points. Here is Smith, game high 27, trying to add to that. Second team All American this year, the U.S. Basketball Writers Association. I think you can put him down first team for next year's club game. <laughs> He's making a pretty good bid right now. He's if he hasn't had the attention of the people across this country, he's going to have it. Smith hits them both, and he's just going to stand at the free throw line and admire the last three seconds. They get it down to Bannister, and Bannister finishes it off. That's it. The final score. Brigham Young, 98. UNC Charlotte, 92. 98-92, the final score in the overtime at the Omni and Atlanta. We'll be talking with Bobby Crevins of Georgia Tech in just a second. First, a recap of what's happened so far in the evening games. Kansas State and LaSalle. K-State in the first half of this game. Wildcats go out and shoot 54% through the first 20 minutes of this contest against the LaSalle Explorers who are on a roll. William Scott had three three-pointers in the first half. This one from the left side. He had 17 points on the game. Mitch Richmond had an outstanding first half. He cans this three. And by halftime, K-State Lonnie Kruger's team is leading it by 11. Well, the Explorers have a run going in the second half. Lionel Simmons, the sophomore, goes to the baseline. He was the leading freshman scorer in the country last year. Sticks that, Jay. Lionel had 20 on the night, but Mitch Richmond, another three. He had 30 points on the game, 17 of those coming in the second half. Richmond does it one more time. He set the single-season Kansas State scoring record tonight. Kansas State wins going away, 66-53. Richmond had those 30 points. K-State is now 23-8. And and again, that final SMU defeating Notre Dame, 83-75, as Cato Armstrong had 29 points. And so SMU moves their record now up to 28-6 as they move along now towards the second uh, round action. They'll play the winner of Duke and BU. We're going to talk some basketball with the head coach of Georgia Tech, and we'll do it as we continue. Uh, NCAA tournament tonight. Welcome back. I'm Bob Lee. We are joined by Bobby Crevins, head coach of Georgia Tech. You've got the game tomorrow, Bob, against Iowa State. And 
this is going to be an interesting time for your team. Georgia Tech coming in. And I think, Bob, as we take a look at you uh, on the sidelines, thumbs up sometimes, I would think. Your team, I think a lot of questions, a lot of people have a lot of questions about where, where you guys are at right now. Uh, it's true, Bob. We're a little bit on a downslide. Uh, to be honest with you, it's been like a bad omen because we checked into our second hotel and there's no ESPN. My players are really mad at me. And it's great, uh, we're only 30 miles away to come up here and see your headquarters here. But uh, I had to get out of my hotel because I couldn't watch any basketball. We're not playing well right now. And uh, we need to regroup. And this is uh, obviously Russian roulette. There's no tomorrow. And I'm just hoping that we can respond. There'll be an interesting matchup, Bobby, at the small forward position. I think two of the most underrated players nationally, your kid, Dwayne Farrell, and they got a great scoring machine in Jeff Grayer. Jeff Grayer reminds me of a former player, Bruce Darrenpo, but a better scorer, Dick. And he's outstanding, as is Lavesta Rhodes. And Johnny Orr, I've been watching him since I've been a player. Great guy. I really hope it will be a great game. There's been some great games today. Just sitting here watching these games is really exciting. How is Hammonds? Is he physically ready to play? He had a bad ankle in the tournament, uh, and I know he's had a great year for you most of the year, and you need the big fella inside. We've got to have Tommy, Dick, and uh, I believe he'll be 100%. He's a, a remarkable young man, and I know he'll be ready. How does your coaching, or does it change at this time of the year, single elimination basketball, do you approach it differently? No, I don't. I approach it, Bob, according to the way we're playing. I I'm not happy right now. Uh, three weeks ago, I thought we could play with anybody in the country. And we just lost that spark. And I, I think several teams, it's happened to several teams. As I watched the games today, I could see teams look different than they did a month ago. And one of the keys to winning is peaking at the right time. So it's really going to be interesting how we come out tomorrow. Who's the take charge guy on your team? Uh, who's going to, Noodles? We need Noodles, but we need to be under control. And we need Dennis Scott's three-point shots. Um, that really gives us a tremendous lift. His shot against DePaul got us on that run there. So we need his outside shooting. And against Iowa State, we've got to get back on defense. Changing the subject, Bobby, you're one of the hot items. You're one of my favorite guys. Uh, you know that there's all kinds of jobs popping up open all over America. Bobby Kremens, he's a hot item. Uh, will we see a Georgia Tech or we'll see somewhere else making mega bucks? I don't feel like a hot item, Dick. If you read, <laughs> if you read the Atlanta papers or if you win the first round of the ACC tournament. Now, I've never had an interview since I've been at Georgia Tech. I'm really happy there. They've taken great care of me. I love my players. And if I can stay there the rest of my life, as long as the program continues to do well, I'll be very happy. Uh, if something goes wrong and you have to move on, that's part of the job. But I, I watch these coaches, and I, uh, several more got fired this, after this season, Dick, and uh, it concerns me. But again, Georgia Tech has been very good to me. Do you think that uh, more of a stand has to be taken by the Coaches Association looking? I mean, there's been talk of tenure. Yeah. You hear the good talk about uh, playing by the rules and doing it ethically, but isn't still the bottom line more important than anything else by a five-to-one margin winning? It is, Bob. There's no question about it. And when P.J. Colissimo went through uh, what he went through, his ordeal, and I, and I watched a young student body president get up and speak, I really got upset, but I was really glad to see... Um, uh, PJ get extended contract. We all we we all know there's insecurity in our business, but we just want to be given a legitimate chance to build a good program and, like you say, not take the shortcuts. It's a difficult situation. Well, it's going to be an interesting game against Iowa State. You've got those two. Let's take a look at some of the uh, players in action in in this game. You've got to stop Breyer and Lefester Rhodes. And as we take a look at these guys in action, uh, we'll take a look first at your guys in action. And again, the, we had the questions about Hammond's ankle. Seems okay. He, he's a real key, and this, um, Dwayne Farrell, and Tommy's had an outstanding year, Bob. He's going to be first-team All-American next year. Farrell, it need, we need a big game out of Dwayne, and Craig Neal with the assists. It's a great move here. Maryland really um, did us in in the ACC tournament, Bob, but they played very well. Bob Wade did an outstanding job preparing for us. Maryland played great. There's no doubt about it. But you look at your basketball team again, your forwards. I don't think many people can put a forward combination like Hammonds and Farrell. If you only had the tree in the middle, why didn't you get the tree? You'd be a national <laughs> champ. Uh, I need you to do some recruiting for me. <laughs> but we're a team without a center, and, that, and that's why I did the up-tempo game, and I, I watched these teams today. But I'm working hard on a center, Dick. I hear reports. There's a kid out in California by the name of Don McLean. Some people say UCLA well, has it. Others say Bobby Kremens. I know you can't comment right. on him, but he's a heck of a player, I hear. He is. I'm not allowed to comment on recruiting. NCAA rules, and I want to keep We don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> okay. We don't want to get you in trouble. Right, Bobby, best of luck tomorrow Thank in you. your game, and maybe Georgia Tech can get it going on the uptick. As we've said, uh, this Thanks Eastern so Regional you, certainly has been loaded. As we continue, next up, we'll have a live presentation of the Naismith Award to the Outstanding Men's Basketball Player in the the country.
as we continue standing by for the Shockers. Here's I'm Bob Lee, and as we have done for the last several years, time now for the announcement of the Naismith Trophy to the outstanding men's basketball player as voted in the balloting by the Atlanta Tip-Off Club. The top five vote-getters comprising the Naismith All-American team, and there is your Naismith All-American team of Sean Elliott of Arizona, Gary Grant, the point guard from Michigan, nation's leading scorer, Hersey Hawkins of Bradley, Danny Manning of Kansas, and Carolina's J.R. Rito at 29 today. The top vote-getter and the Naismith Trophy recipient, Kansas, Danny Manning. And the superlatives just flow when you take a look at the array of skills that Danny has. Well, Mr. Versatility, he can do it all. He can pass the basketball. He's going to be a great number three man in the NBA. He's going to be an outstanding small forward. With his great size, he'll create a lot of mismatches. He can shoot the basketball. I really love his style of play. He's got great versatility. I think that's his best asset. So the shot block right there, there's been talk of the, the game of the 90s, the way this game of college basketball is changing, and players of Danny's stature on the court and the way that they're able to utilize all their skills. These are the numbers, 24 four points a game nearly 60 percent on field goals nine rebounds 59 blocks 67 assists and best of all danny manning joins us live this evening from lincoln nebraska congratulations danny let me ask you what part of your game it's been talked about you've got all this good what part of your game are you proudest of well uh i really like to pass the ball you know i think uh when I get the ball inside, a lot of teams like to double team and triple team down low and, and sag in. So I like to find the open man and I like to get an assist. You, you know, Danny, you talk about your senior year here. They really didn't help you out with a full cast. You've been doing a one man show out there. Do you feel a little frustrated at the end of your senior year that you haven't been able to have in terms of the team concept, the banner year? I know your stats are great. Well, uh, you know, start of the year, we had uh, a lot of guys on the team, and we've lost some, you know, casualties to injuries and to grades. And so, you know, we lost our starting center and uh, small forward. And, uh, you know, the responsibilities I have for the team changed. But I think the guys have responded well. We put them in a position where they weren't comfortable, but, you know, they come out and they work hard every day, and they're doing the things we ask them to. What are the things that you guys have got to do tomorrow? You guys got spanked in the Big 8 semi by K-State. What's got to click that wasn't clicking for you guys? Well, uh, we came out and we didn't play good pressure defense. We let the guys from K-State dribble the ball where they wanted to, and therefore they had good shots in the lane, nice 15-footers, and uh, they were hitting their shots, and we didn't play that good defense, and that really hurt us. Hey, Danny, number one, I want to ask you, do you have any priority where you'd like to play in the NBA? Well, no, I don't have any priorities. I'd just like to go to an NBA team and be able to compete and help them out. Uh, number two, Danny, have you got an agent yet? Because I want to represent you. I want to make some cash. <laughs> No, I don't have an agent yet. And get that shirt off. New York Giants, that's bad luck. They had a terrible year this year. <laughs> Danny Manny, congratulations. Recipient of the 1988 Naismith Trophy. You'll be honored at that dinner at the Atlanta Tip-Off Club in early April. And good luck tomorrow, Danny. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Danny see, Manning of the Kansas Jayhawks. Well, I'll see him down there. I'm going to speak That's again right. at that uh, banquet. Again? I've been they have, have you back again. Have, have me back again. I'm looking forward to going down here. Even though, please don't tell Danny, I thought Hersey Hawkins had a phenomenal year this year. a chance to Danny, do it. Danny is certainly the best talent in America. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about it in terms of pure talent. But I thought this year, I guess I'm wrong again. My vote went with Hawkins, but uh, he certainly represents college basketball well. He's had a brilliant four-year career. Well, the Naismith Trophy also is awarded to the outstanding women's player and that balloting from the Atlanta Tip-Off Club. And again, this is the Naismith women's All-American team. Michelle Edwards of Iowa, Bridget Gordon of Tennessee, Vicki Orr of Auburn, Teresa Weatherspoon of Louisiana Tech, and Sue Wicks of Rutgers, the top vote-getter and the Naismith women's trophy winner. Sue Wicks of Rutgers, the all-time leading scorer, male or female, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, averaging 21.3 per game. A dominant force for the Scarlet Knights. They talk so often of her dedication, how she constantly works with an Incredible intensity to hone her game. She holds the career rebounding mark at about 11 a game. 250 steals and blocks and assists. The numbers just add up. And Sue Wicks, a dominant four stick on the floor for the latest Scarlet Knights. Bob, I read some great comments about her and her work ethic in a recent article. I know one thing the male team could have utilized her this year. <laughs> She's a great, great scorer. And I've heard fantastic things about her from other people in women's basketball. Okay, and uh, congratulations to Sue. She, again, will be uh, awarded uh, that trophy and honored at that same banquet in Atlanta in early April. We've got a game to get to, to Paula Wichita State. We've got some scores to check and we will do so after
It is DePaul at Wichita State. Joey Meyer coaching DePaul. Wichita State, Eddie Fogler, longtime assistant Dick at North Carolina with Dean Smith and second straight year. He's rolled up his sleeves. His team's here in the tournament. He's done a fantastic job in two years getting two NCAA berths. Uh, his name is being bandied around. We talked about it earlier. Texas possibly. Uh, I know Texas is interested also in Lonnie Kruger, and I don't blame him. What a job he's done in revitalizing Kansas State's program. Hey, what about Larry Brown, you were telling me? He says it, and we'll hear it tomorrow on videotape flat out. He says he's back next year. He's going to oh. take you on the bed. Well, Come and clean the Fog Allen Fieldhouse floor October 15th. You I'll can get tell on us my if, knees. I'll right. clean it if he's coaching Kansas. He will be out of Kansas and will not be on that sideline next season. Wayne Thanks, Larry, Bobby. Jim Gibbons, it's all yours. Wayne Larravee and Jim Gibbons, we're back at the Joyce Athletic and Convocation Center. There are the officials for tonight's game. Mike Corey on the right, Harrington to the middle, and Paul Hausman on the, the left. Just about set to go. Wichita State, solid gold uniforms, black and white trim. DePaul in the home uniform, solid white with the blue and red trim. And Rodney Strickland in transition right away to Stanley Grundy. <laughs> Took less than 10 seconds for DePaul to grab the lead. Wichita State will use a motion offense. They'll try to control the tempo here. Off the hands that time of Prelo, Dwight Prelo, and it belongs to DePaul. DePaul has to be sharp, Wayne. They rely on their quickness, and that's exactly what they've done so far. When they're able to use their quickness, they generally win. They aren't going to beat you up in size with size and inside with size and strength, but they'll do it on their quickness. Strickland gets the step. Good dish down low to Grundy, hard off the glass. Stanley Brundy with the first two field goals of the game. How many times have we said how much he creates? And he does, and those people like Brundy get themselves in a position to score. This is Dwayne Prelo, Sasha Radunovic on the block inside. We mentioned to the open, Sasha Radunovic would be a key here. He struggled in the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament down at Peoria. Brundy out high now. This is Rod Strickland. Prelo controlled the board for a moment. Brundy gets it back. Kevin Holland. That's what they're fighting for. Easter eggs. The final four. again. There's that lob against that defense. And the second time, Louisville's been successful with it in the first half. They will throw that ball up there. Five points for Miss Ellison. The Cardinals up by three against Oregon State with 8.49 left in first half action here. Both teams got off to very slow starts. Louisville getting the first basketball game with 17.02 left in the half. Oregon State didn't score. So there was 15.25 left. Cardinal fans getting into it now. Sending up a rocket in the Omni Knox. Blocked by Purvis Ellison. Ellison now has blocks in 38 consecutive games and 95 blocks for the year. There he goes. Catches, turns, score, no score. Felton Spencer, the seven-footer, throws it up. No. Ellison tips. No. Keith Williams, a guard, takes it up and scores, and he was fouled. The basket's going to count. Keith Williams has four. Fred, they will dominate you on that backboard if you give them a chance. And watch it right here. Knox goes up. Ellison gets a little piece of it. Spencer comes up with the basketball, and they take it to the other end. Once they get it to the other end, they dominate the backboard. Watch the pass into Ellison. The spin, right move, down the lane, up. He misses. Watch Spencer grab the rebound. He's down and misses. Then Williams gets it and sticks it back up. Drew the foul. Missed the foul shot. Four points, Keith Williams. Cardinals doing a number off the backboards, leading that game by five. Now we'll get you back to our primary game in the Midwest. The Paul in Wichita State. Paul in the white. Wayne Larvey, Jim Gibbons. Foul coming up against the Blue Demons. They're going to call Kevin Edwards on the foul. His first team is over the limit. 2.57 left to go first half. It has been all to Paul thus far here. This Midwest Regional first round game. And Notre Dame, Indiana. For those of you wondering, Notre Dame, Indiana is in fact the town that we are in, not South Bend anymore. It's Notre Dame, Indiana. Jim Notre Gibbons, Dame, Indiana. you live in South Bend, right? <laughs> About a block down the street. <laughs> Grayer at the free throw line. Two points so far tonight. Oh, Katie, the head coach of Purdue, made the reception in the stands on that play. 
We've come to halftime. It has been a most impressive first half for the Blue Demons of DePaul. They play on the lead, 39 to 25. 14-point lead for DePaul in that game. We'll get back to it in just a second and also have a chance on the NCAA tournament tonight. Good evening, I'm Bob Lee along with Dick Vitale. To take a look back at what we have seen so far and what's happening at this moment this evening, such as in the Western Regional between Boise State and Michigan. Michigan has led from the get-go and really has never even looked back. Here we are in the second half. Glenn Rice will drop this one off to Terry Mills. Look for a pass. Loy Vaught. Where is he in the paint? There he is. And he gets the roll. That game now is midway through the second half, and Michigan is enjoying that 48-32 advantage. That's the first of the two evening games of the West Regional being played at Salt Lake City at the uh, Huntsman uh, Center. So we'll keep an eye on that game through the entire evening. Louisville and Oregon State as well. That game is still uh, midway first half. Cards doing a nice number off the backboard, but now with four and a half minutes to go in that first half, the Cards have only a two-point lead over Oregon State, 20-18, to 18, as uh, that's in the Southeastern Regional. Also, Boston University and Duke. B you shooting extremely well early in this game against Duke, one of the top seeds in this region. First half, the Terriers are hanging tough, but Duke still has the lead. Danny Ferry will take this feed from the corner, has an opening, and puts it on home. Duke is on top. There is still a few minutes to go now, we understand, in that first half, and Duke has the lead by the count of 7, 37 to 30. Earlier tonight, here on ESPN, the game between Notre Dame and SMU, the Fighting Irish on St. Patrick's Day. The magic just uh, did not happen tonight. The Irish, though, took an early lead in this game against the Mustangs as David Rivers gets it up. Jameer Jackson and the Irish leading it by five. But the Mustangs come right on back as Rivers, uh-uh, Terry Thomas with the stuff. Vernon Purdue spots Cato Armstrong. Cato nails it. SMU has the one-point halftime lead. Now the second half, Rivers on the baseline will find Gary Vose. He's in trouble. Vose, though, gets the pass. The Irish up by three. Vose at 24 in the game. Back come the Mustangs again on the break. Armstrong, who at 29, gets two important points right here. And late in the game, SMU's up 55 to 50. The Irish try to keep it close. Rivers opened one for eight in the shooting department, then began to click. The scoop attempt here ties the game at 62, but SMU is able to pull it out. Watch Carlton McKinney all alone on the break. No one within a shillelagh's length of him, 83-75. So SMU with the victory over Notre Dame. That's in the Eastern Regional. Uh, after that game, we talked uh, with Dan Bonner, who spoke to some of the heroes of that game. Let's take a look. We've got head coach Dave Bliss of the Southern Methodist Mustangs. Dave, it finally looked like you were able to relax at the end of the game. A pretty tough battle. Well, even when we had that 11-point lead, they came back, and we made a couple of errors on the inbounds passes. But all in all, you know, we're just really pleased to win. Uh, I thought Notre Dame had a great game plan against us. We got in a lot of foul trouble. But we hung in there, and it's a... It's a six-point game against Boise State. Frank Ballard and Bruce Larson were in Salt Lake City. Frank Fallon back with Bruce Larson at the John M. Huntsman Center on the campus of the University of Utah. And Bruce, this has turned into a pretty good basketball game. Boise State's cut it down to six points with only 59 seconds remaining. And as you see, Michigan has a couple of timeouts left. Boise State has one. Well, they can kill the clock. Uh, plenty of time for a couple of three-pointers, and we're close to an overtime. And if Boise State can score, they've got one timeout to use to stop the clock. As you've indicated, Frank, Michigan has two. All right, they set up to run three-pointers. Full court pressure by Boise State. And a foul called on Wilson Foster. He had three at the half, has gone all this time without getting his fourth until now. Well, I'm sure Boise State wanted to go for the steal, and if they didn't get it, uh, the foul. And uh, Michigan has not been good at the foul line here in the last two minutes. Uh, two of their better shooters have missed. Coach and again, the miss here will give an opportunity to score that three. And that used up only one second on the clock. 58 seconds remaining in the ballgame. Glenn Rice tonight is one for two. And he's an 81% shooter, but Grant was 83, and he missed his last time in. So pressure, maybe a little tired, the big guys. Uh, these are important free throws for Michigan. Rice right through the bottom. The leading scorer in the Big Ten with an average of 22.1, but tonight he has only 11. And Gary Grant, his teammate, has only nine. So if it was Bobby Dyer's intent to slow down his two big scores, he's done that. Boise State just needed to shoot better early. They still got a shot at it. Let's see if they set up for three. 
Down by eight with 54 seconds to play. Ryan King is their long-range bomber. King for three. Had to hurry. That one taken by Wilson Foster wouldn't go. Nice jam by Greg Dodd. Boy, great follow. 30 seconds. Six-point lead. Six-point lead for the Michigan wow. Wolverines. Too bad Boise State foul. They got Grant to throw the ball away again on that play. And Doug Usatello picks up his second foul. Last time at the line, the Grant misses the front end of a one-on-one. -on -one. Terry throw shooter. Pressure's on him. There he is, an All-American guard, Gary Grant. Tonight, way below his average, only nine points. Boise State uses one of those two remaining timeouts. With 30 seconds remaining to play, well, I guess that's their last timeout. Michigan has two remaining. Well, the NCAA is conducting research during this basketball tournament, and we'd like your participation. That's one, Gregor. They really needed one bad. They, did they foul Mills? They fouled him. Yep. That stops the clock with 13 seconds to go. Boy, that three-point play has really changed college basketball. It has, and that's a good play right there by Boise State. Put Mills on. They've been successful now. You know, that's a poor play if you come down and make the free throws, but Michigan has really helped them. They haven't made the front end of a one-on-one -on -one yet in the last three times, and they've had very good free-throw shooters at the line. And Mills has not been at the line yet tonight. This will be his first free-throw opportunity. He is a 73% free-throw shooter, but he hasn't shot one yet tonight. And we consider that good free-throw shooting, but they've hit the three previous shooters, Rice, Grant twice. They've been over 80% shooters, and they haven't been able to convert. One and one for Terry Mills. Sophomore from Romulus, Michigan. Missed it. It belonged to Boise State. With only 12 seconds to go, Michigan calls the timeout. Well, Boise State's got an opportunity. Michigan, well, that's an interesting timeout by Bill Frieder, Bruce, with 12 seconds to go. I guess he wants to be real sure of what he's doing defensively. Right, I think they want to make sure that uh, they take away the three-point shot. They don't really care. Can you believe, Dick Vitale, what we are looking at? Michigan cannot put away Boise State. Excellent uh, defensive team this year, and they're starting to hit their shots now. Well, remember this, that Michigan's had problems in the past in the tournament, especially in the first round. They had trouble with Fairleigh Dickinson one year, then they had trouble <laughs> with... Uh, you're laughing at me because you thought my microphone fell no, down no, again. No, I know no, you no, did. No. But they had trouble also with... Uh, wasn't it Akron that they had trouble with as well? I remember the Michigan the FDU round? game in 85, so they have trouble coming out of the gate, right? Well, here's the thing that really amazes me there. Boise State doesn't have any timeouts. Michigan calls the timeout, Bill Frieder does, to allow them now to set up their offensive pattern that they want. Now, I know his argument will be that I want to make sure that we get into a good defensive set, but I don't know about the rationale on that. I'm, I don't agree with that strategy. I really don't. And uh, I, I think that right there, giving them a chance to set up for the last shot, get a screen, could maybe, maybe make it an OT. Ooh. We've seen it already once tonight between BYU and UNC Charlotte. Okay, 12 seconds to go. Boise State down three. They've got to go the length of the court and nail a three. Frank Fallon. Free throws. Then you're, re then you're, uh, you're relying on your basketball team to get the ball inbound safely. So it's kind of interesting what might, what, what might happen. Bruce, they tell us, too, now that, uh, that, uh, the, that the timeout situation is Boise State does have one timeout left, and Michigan has one left. So I thought it was uh, thought it by was three. Michigan might even force them into a two-pointer. Pressure. They can use the clock. Brian King, they've got their shooter. Didn't get it. A foul with one second left. So Brian King had to shoot from about 25 feet away and didn't get it. And you now have to give one the, second left. Michigan, Michigan credit for good defense. Uh, they extended the shot, you know, just a little further. They knew what they had to do. Boise State, on the other hand, got the shot. Well, Michigan will apparently hold everybody back. 61-58, one second to play. And at the line for the Wolverines, Mike Griffin missed his only free throw tonight. But it would be awfully hard with one second to go for anything more than just a desperation length of the floor heave for uh, Boise State. 
And Wright might even have a, you know, even a miss would start the clock right away, but a make would make it impossible for them to. Well, that really won it. That won the ball game right there, didn't it? That Four did. point lead with one second to go. They finally hit the one they needed to. So Mike Griffin hit the free throw that Michigan had to have. That makes the second one a little bit easier. One second to go. It's a five point lead. So the Michigan Wolverines have prevailed, but not before a scare by the Boise State Broncos of the Big Sky Conference. So the ball game is over. It's 63 58, Michigan over Boise State. We'll be back. Didn't come easy. Bobby Dye's team takes him down to the wire. Michigan escapes. They'll play the winner of the game between Florida and St. John's coming up a little bit later in Salt Lake City. Vic, uh, this is a team that really showed during the down the balance of the regular season coming in with the win streak having won so impressively. You know, momentum means so much. And you look at some of the teams that brought it with them, such as Rhode Island, and uh, here another example of it. Well, Rhode Island and DePaul have a very similar uh, uh, situation. They have both great backcourts. When you talk about Garrick and Owens, certainly for Rhode Island, that really is, is what their team is all about. But you look at DePaul, Kevin Edwards has really mm. become an outstanding player, and we all know about Rod Strickland. Uh, Joey Meyer, middle of the year, struggling, but right now has got to feel really good. And his teams do well, as you said earlier, in yeah. postseason tournament. Last year, they surprised some people. So they have been proven uh, to be good performers. Now, let's take a look at the Midwest brackets. This was the home of the blowout today. None of these games were closer than 13 points. Looking down the line now towards Saturday, for these games to be played in South Bend or Notre Dame, Indiana. Purdue against Memphis State. DePaul against Kansas State. Let's talk about Purdue Memphis State because uh, for Gene Cady's uh, sake, <laughs> this one's not being played in Memphis as it was a couple of years ago. And uh, Purdue went out today, took no prisoners. Well, also for his sake is the fact that uh, Larry Finch's basketball team doesn't have the great cast that was predicated or predicted actually earlier this year when he had Marvin Alexander and he had Sylvester Gray. They're playing without those people. Uh, Purdue should handle Memphis State. I think Larry Finch, if he can win this game, they should put him in a basketball hall of fame. This guy's been doing it with mirrors. Yes, he has. Got a great little guard who I love. He looks a lot like Johnny Dawkins. Elliot Perry's going to be a diaper dandy. And I'll tell you one thing that Purdue can never beat him with. They have the best dance girls in America. Oh, Uno, hands number down. one. I mean, it's Lock City when you look at the Memphis State dance girls. Traffic stopped today in the newsroom to watch that halftime show Incredible. in Toto. Okay, now let's get you caught up on what's happening elsewhere around the country. Uh, Southeast Louisville is shooting 83% in the second half. Look at this. Leading Oregon State now 59-43. This was a tie game at 28 apiece at halftime. The card's looking tough. Now in the East Regional at Chapel Hill tonight, uh, BU's got the bench set. Uh, side on and Duke's up now comfortably by 15 points. This was a Duke 11 point lead at halftime. Elsewhere around the country tonight, Southern Methodist with the victory over Notre Dame. The Irish lose on St. Patrick's Day. Cato Armstrong had 29 points in this game and SMU, the number seven seed, moves along in the east. Syracuse who went earlier this afternoon against North Carolina A&T 69-55. That final score, Stevie Thompson had 21 in that game. We'll check more scores. We've got much more to take a look at. And get a Only seven seconds to go. The fire We'll be back with the final seven seconds of this ball game. With time out of the floor, 83, 69, BU3. No doubt about who's going to win this game, and Duke, of course, your selection to win the East Regional. I think Michigan really is going to get by the next round. They'll beat either Florida or St. John's. They'll finally get over that little hump. They have a tremendous starting five. I think Boise State presented some problems psychologically for them to get up for, but they were able to hang in there. That strategy at the end of the game, we were a little confused as to whether or not Michigan, or Boise State rather, had any timeouts. I couldn't understand why Bill Frieda would call the T.O. and call a timeout if Boise State didn't have any and allow them to set up the last shot. But then we heard that they might have had one timeout either squad. Well, still, if you're Bill Frieda, you want to make it clear to your kids down three, you can commit the semi-intentional foul, make it look good, and uh, give two shots up. Well, I thought I was the analyst. Now you're stealing all my stuff. I was ready to say that. You want to do both jobs, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. There's no use me staying here. Is that a you promise? Go, hey, Bob, seriously, why don't more teams? I don't understand the strategy. You're up three. They're coming down the court. There's a few seconds left why not foul I know you don't foul intentionally if you're going after the ball but not allow them to shoot the three to tie the game up I don't understand that. do you think we have seen a consistent interpretation this year of the intentional foul yes we have whether or not I buy it or not but it's been consistent from the standpoint that they have called it a one-on-one -on -one if you've made an attempt to play the ball many times we know that they're deliberately going to stop the clock but the rule states very emphatically if the defensive player is making an effort to play the ball, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation. Coming along tomorrow's our 
Wall to wall coverage continues day two of the first round. Arkansas and Villanova getting underway at noon Eastern time. That's from the Southeast Regional. Then our next action as we move down our broadcast schedule, Richmond and Indiana as the Hoosiers get into action at 2.30 Eastern time. Then they'll have to strap us both in for UTEP and Seton Hall going at it in the West Regional. And it looks like the winner of this one will be taking on Arizona. That's at 5 Eastern time. Our evening games tomorrow. Of course, we'll have our live reports from all around the country. The number one team in the country, Temple, taking on Lehigh. The brown and white are the engineers. They are in a bit of a nickname uh, dilemma right now at Lehigh, but uh, they're going to take on Temple at 7 Eastern time tomorrow night. And our second game tomorrow night, LSU and Georgetown from the East Regional. And as always, as we get underway at 11.55 a.m., we will have reports from around the country taking you where the action is. How to see tomorrow? Is that a promise? Well, I'll be here for 12 hours. I know you'll sleep till about 3 or 4. You'll arrive at 7, and I'll already work about 4 or 5 hours. Hours, but I'm trying to catch you financially, and I got to do all this. You got a long, I got a long way to go. Yeah, okay. Louisville late in the game now. 48 seconds in this game. The Cards have a 10-point lead, well on their way to a victory. Let's take a look back now at the sights and the sounds of a very busy day of the tournament. and happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. I'm Jim Nance, along with James Brown. And coming up in just a few moments, we'll be going out to Salt Lake City for opening round action in the West region as Florida of the SEC takes on St. John's of the Big East. But first, let's get you caught up on some of tonight's first round action. Some of it just concluded, James. Two out of the three scores are finals, Jimmy. Let's start first in the Midwest region where DePaul had no problems with Wichita State. Rod Strickland led the way with 19 points, 13 assists, as they go on to beat Wichita State 83-62. DePaul now plays Kansas State on Saturday. In the East region, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Duke University, a balanced team effort. They beat Boston University 85-69. Danny Ferry paced the way with 21 points, 8 rebounds. They now play SMU on Saturday. And Louisville, Oregon State down in the Southeast region in Atlanta. Louisville leading by 7 with about 12 seconds left in that game. That's an NCAA Productions telecast. Let's take a peek in on that game with announcers Fred White and Larry Connolly. We'd like to welcome those of you watching along the CBS network now to the final seconds of this one. Louisville is going to put it away. Purvis Ellison's 23rd point makes it 70-61. Louisville over Oregon State and that's the ball game and the Cardinals advance now to second round action. They got big nights from Purvis Ellison and Herb Crook. Denny Crum shaking Ralph Miller's hand. All right, Louisville so Louisville comes away with the victory. And, of course, you remember Louisville won the NCAA championship back in 86, looking to defend that title. And as Jim Nance mentioned, we'll be taking you out to Salt Lake City, Utah, for the Florida St. John's game with Brent Musburger and Billy Packer. That after these messages from your local station. This is CBS. The road 
to Kansas City in the NCAA championship now winds to the beautiful mountain city of Salt Lake City, Utah. Welcome now to game four of the West region here. It's the St. John's Redmen of the Big East taking on the Florida Gators of the Southeastern Conference. Look at the brackets and what's unfolded already here at the University of Utah. North Carolina and Loyola Marymount will take on each other Saturday afternoon. A few minutes ago, Michigan was almost forced into overtime, but they survived against Boise State by five points. Now it is Florida and St. John's. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I'm Brent Musburger. What to expect from these two teams tonight? We really don't know. St. John's is relieved, happy, just glad to be in the field of 64. As for Florida, when the season began, a lot of folks said this team can go all the way to Kansas City. But the season began in turmoil. Vernon Maxwell was suspended for the first two games of the year. Then they rallied to win the NIT. But two weeks ago, Chris Capers quit after losing his starting job for a second time. Then center Dwayne Shenses defied Coach Norm Sloan in refusing to come off the bench in last week's loss to Georgia. In the same game, starting point guard Ronnie Montgomery was suspended by the coach for his involvement in this fight. And then just yesterday, Patrick Aaron was sent home for a violation of team discipline. But Sloan is smiling. I got them together out in the middle of the court, and I said, you know, fellas, I've never been around a Cinderella team before. And I said, you guys have a chance to be the Cinderella team in this tournament now. You're shorthanded, just a few people. Everybody in the nation will see it out there. I think you can get a lot of people pulling for you if you'll just get out and play your hearts out. Well, Billy Packer shorthanded indeed. The Gators came out to warm up. Only eight men are in uniform here tonight at this altitude. Uh, Billy, your feeling about what they're going to do tonight? Well, it takes a lot away from their game. They used to be a very good pressing team. Now it's going to be a half-court game with Louis Karnasek. Maxwell can play the point guard. As a matter of fact, he may be even more effective there. But the key for this team is which Dwayne Chinsius are we going to see? And for St. John's and Louis Karnasek tonight? I think we're going to see him use a revolving door center position, not let Chinsius get off, and maybe use some fire at that position. All right, we're going to come back. It'll be St. John's at the Big East against the Florida Gators of the Southeastern Conference coming your way live on CBS in just a moment. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. CBS Sports coverage of today's NCAA basketball championship first round game from Salt Lake City is sponsored by Michelob Light. When the sun goes down, light up the night with Michelob Light. Delco Electronics, from car music systems to onboard computers. Automotive Electronics, it's who we are. And by the heartbeat of America, today's Chevrolet. Points now, Pitt has the lead. In the southeast, Texas, San Antonio, and Illinois, it's early. Illinois, the Illini with the lead. In the west, in Los Angeles, Coral now in Arizona. Arizona's up big. Right now, back to Hartford. Bob Carpenter with Dan Belwamini, Hartford, and it's Keith Smart at the line looking for his 11th point. Wolf just drew his second foul. That will be a factor in the ball game as Smart has 11, and he is now a guy who scored nine of Indiana's 13 first 13 points. In fact, they had to come out with Wolfhook, so they've got Kratz, Kratzer and Winecki in there at the same time. So they're going to lose a little offensive punch. And they're going to need their outside guys to make a few shots. Rice jumping it in, getting it back from Winecki, skying for a three-pointer. Rodney Rice is two for two from that range. He, too, is into double figures. It's 2018. No kind of tournament so far for Rodney Rice. This is smart. Back to Jones. The steal by Ken Atkinson. Keying the break. Feeling his way through. Smart from behind fouling him. Good defensive that play that time by Atkinson. He might have hurt his... Looks like he's holding his wrist as he's getting up. We've got some real streaks going here. Atkinson leading that break. Good steal that time by Atkinson. Now Smart's going to come from behind, but Atkinson definitely knows what to do with the ball as he gets in the lane. He's checking shot. Or pass, but gets fouled from the back by Smart. Smart is good. And number 11, Todd Hall. From Cincinnati, 3.13 left in the first half. Illinois leading Texas San Antonio, 32-28. UTSA broke on top, led by as many as four. Illinois came right back, though, and it's been nip and tuck ever since. Loose ball and a foul whistled against Illinois. It'll be on Kendall Gill, his first foul. And number seven on the fighting Illini. So 
so Texas San Antonio will go to the line to shoot the bonus. Lou Henson's club struggling here early as the favorite against Texas San Antonio. Lou Henson's club's known as defensive clubs. You saw the quick hands almost resulted in a steal. You also saw Ken Burmeister, the second-year coach at Texas San Antonio out of the Trans-America Conference. Free throw no good by Todd Barnes. And Illinois with the rebound, a chance to take its biggest lead of the game. Interesting statistic. Um, we felt that Texas San Antonio, Tom, had the advantage on the boards. Illinois has more than held their own, leading in that category 14 to 8 so far. Surprising number. Blackwell fakes, doesn't shoot. Gill will. No good. Hamilton, strong offensive rebound. He lays it in. I'm telling you what, Illinois would not be in this ballgame without that young man. He's done it offensively. The Southeast, Illinois leads Texas San Antonio. Now let's go back to the East. Indiana and Richmond and a good one in Hartford. So Richmond with 18 fouls, Indiana with just six. Todd Jadlow shooting a one and one. Jadlow's come off the bench and already has reached his season average of five points. He's two of three from the field. Three offensive rebounds and that free throw. Well, he's been him six. He's been a key player, Bob, for Indiana. He's come in and give him a big lift. But Richmond's played an outstanding first half. Good transition and score. It's just about the best. Well, they just outman him at every position on the floor. That's to be expected. And uh, I think people would realize that when you just look at the recruiting dollars and the budgets of Arizona versus Cornell. I think an interesting matchup, though, is our game. Richmond and Indiana. You have two outstanding coaches. One that gets a lot of publicity in ink and Bobby Knight and a guy by the name of Dick Tarrant. Remember, we talked about at 84, he beats Charles Barkley and also Chuck Person and an Auburn team. And the kid Rodney Rice that's scoring for them, he played at Boston College. He's a transfer. Do you think Jimmy O'Brien would like to have him at Boston College? Without question, he certainly would like to have him. Let's move on. Texas San Antonio facing Illinois. This in the southeast region being played at Cincinnati. Illinois, a hard-fought game in the first half as Lou Henson's crew simply could not pull away in a game against Texas San Antonio. Here's a look at the highlights right now. Illinois took three minutes to score his first basket. Stop the shot of Barnes. Glenn Blackwell gives it Kenny Battle, and Kenny Battle takes it in for two as he leans his way at the half. Texas San Antonio, however, just down by seven. Illinois leads it 38 to 31 at halftime. Lou Henson trying to advance. Remember last year, they were upset by Austin P in the first round, and I know there's someone who sits to my right <laughs> who will not soon forget that. In the Midwest, it was Eastern Michigan and Pittsburgh. As you look at the Arizona score at halftime, 36 to 19. But now the Midwest, Eastern Michigan and Pittsburgh. Eastern Michigan, the Hurons, it's been a tremendous year for that program at Ypsilanti. Of course, they won the Mid-American Conference in football and won in the California Bowl as well, and now trying to surprise in basketball. Eastern Michigan runs out of gas, however, in the second half. Jerome Lane, the Porter, watched the bounce pass to Demetrius Gore, who lays it off the glass. 22 points for Gore. Charles Smith, what nice hands inside for Smith, who had 33 points. Showtime late. Porter back to Jerome Lane, who flies through the lane and jams it in. 108 to 90 is the final that's the most points Pittsburgh has scored this year against Eastern Michigan but coach you have to be impressed first of all with what the Hurons did they were in the game for most of the game and only late could Pittsburgh get away they played him very tough uh, in fact it was like a two-point game uh, late in the game but then the explosive attack Mr. Lane Charles Smith who really uh, to me I think we're gonna have a great tournament however I think as far as they can go Maybe the sweet, maybe get to the eight. I'd say a little bit beyond the sweet 16, but I can't see them going to the final four. Even though their front court is so strong, you think the back court could hold them out of the final four? I think one of the key ingredients for success in the NCAAs in tournament time is to have good guard play. It's mandatory that you get a good shot with each possession. And I think the guard play becomes almost more important than perimeter, than inside play, rather. And, and I think their guard play, though, Miller's going to be a great one. He is young, and that pressure gets tighter and tighter and I'll tell you something what I love to watch did you see Paul Evans one time he exploded on the sideline what else is new I'll tell you Paul Evans is getting to be where he makes Bobby Knight look like a saint <laughs> oh Bobby Knight of course the team love. many felt were on the bubble coming into this one today that bubble burst completely as Georgia Tech came away with a victory it was hard fought however they started fast Dennis Scott hands the three-pointer tech led by seven to nothing early cyclones got their offense heated up lafesta road drills the three-pointer he had a great day 34 points game was close most of the way dennis scott spots tom hammonds inside 
And Hammonds had a tremendous game. The fake goes up and with the right hand puts it down. Johnny Orr Cyclones like to run off the break. Gary Tompkins finds LaFesta Rhodes who lays it in. They're coming back from nine down. Cyclones also had a big game from Jeff Grayer. The senior hits the jumper in the lane. He had 29. But Tech pulled away down the stretch. Dennis Scott finds Hammonds inside. He scores and is fouled. 90 to 78 was the final. Georgia Tech comes away with a victory. Tom Hammonds had 33. That's a career high. 19 of 21 from the free throw line. This game was decided from there. Georgia Tech, 36 points from the free throw line. Iowa State, only 11. Arkansas and Villanova. Now, this one from the Southeast region, which was played in Cincinnati. Villanova, the Wildcats under Roley Massimino, have never lost in the first round. They were 8-0 and coming in, trying to make it 9 straight. Doug West intercepts the outlet pass feed to Rodney Taylor for the slam. Wildcats led by 7 at the half. Villanova never trailed in the second half. The ball goes inside to Massey. The blind pass to Tom Grice, who gets the 2. Grice would finish with 15 points. Fury then buries its three-pointer as he tries to keep the Razorbacks in the game. He ended up with 21. But Villanova keeps its poise. Alley-oop time. Kenny Wilson to Gary Massey, who dunks it with authority. Just a matter of time. Doug West goes one-on-one -on -one with Keith Wilson. And West scores and is fouled. Three-point play. West with 22 points as Villanova and Roley Massimino has another victory. He is now 9-0 in the first round of the tournament, 82-74. Doug West at 22. Kenny Wilson had 17. All of those came in the second half. And, Coach, you have to be impressed with what Roley was. At the beginning of this season, many people were saying this could be a down year for Villanova. Here they are winning again. Well, the reason they said that, because he had the down year last year. He looks like Danny DeVito on that sideline. <laughs> I really do. I think I'm looking at Danny DeVito instead of Roley Massimino. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the kid West had a great game. And he played in that famed Dapper Dan game. And the reason I mention that is because Sonny Vaccaro, who runs the Dapper Dan, is here in our studios and does a great job with that game. But I remember seeing West uh, uh, just a potential great athlete who I don't think has yet blossomed to be the kind of player that people thought he'd be when he came out of high school, though he's had moments of greatness. If Roley Massimino looks like Danny DeVito, maybe wants a new movie, throw Dick Vitale from the train. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, <laughs> he can throw me anywhere he wants if he writes out that check, baby, and it's all in the acting style, because Roley likes to get that check, too. Okay, stay with us. There is plenty more to come here on the NCAA Tournament today. We'll be back with more in just Play. a He says, okay, I'll start right from here. And I've got the ball? He says, yeah, you got the ball. Okay, let's start playing. Handling it. Rodney Rice, an outstanding outside shooter. Stapleton is not a man who will be taking many shots down the stretch. Of course, they take Garrett out of the game because Garrett's in foul trouble. And Bob Knight does not want Dean Garrett to foul out, so they take him out on this sequence. Under a minute. Rice. Yes! The two-pointer. The coaches all say he hit for three, but they only give him two. 21 for Rodney Rice. Indiana timeout with 48 seconds remaining. And now Richmond has the one-point lead back. A timeout on the court with the score. Spider 70, Hoosier 69. As it should be with 48 seconds remaining. And Dan, the replay shows the officials were right on top of this one. It was indeed a two-pointer. Not even close this time uh, to a three-point shot. They usually do make the right call when you take another look at it. But Rice makes a difficult shot under pressure to give the Spiders a lead. Dean Garrett, who was out of the game defensively because of four fouls, they did take the shot on the perimeter. But I'm sure Garrett will be back for offense as Indiana gets the ball. It might take a long time to play this last 48 seconds because Bob Knight has three timeouts left. Dick Tarrant with one. And they're going to a box and one now. They're going to play Edwards man to man. And they got fouls to take. Only four team fouls that Richmond has. So they can come out and pressure. Nobody's guarding Jones. Nobody's guarding. Martin Jones throws one out. Ball is loose. Jones got it and he was fouled. Maybe the biggest rebound of that freshman's first year at Division I. Well, Dick Terrence playing this just like he did at the start. He's letting some players shoot who don't normally do in key situation, and it's working. Jones with the shot, and more importantly, got the rebound, but not a shooting situation. Only the fifth team foul, so it goes out of bounds to Indiana. Nice his third foul. Coleman for Jones. Smart. Missing. Rebound. Rice. Richmond has the ball. And a breakaway. Need a three-point. There's still time. They need a three-point shot. So have the presence of mind to 
to shoot a three-pointer. Not inside. That's it. Outside. Hillman for three. No, and Richmond wins. Well, they said the East Regional was loaded, but what a job by Dick Tarrant. Yes, we do have our first major and stunning upset of this tournament. 72 to 69, the Richmond Spiders pull it off. I see Dick Vitale beside me shaking his head. You talk about the general all the time. You talk about Robert Montgomery Knight. But for the second time since 1986, his club is gone in the first round. Now, can I correct you again? Go major ahead. upset? There's no upset. This Indiana team has been struggling all year, basically. No shock other than the names we told you earlier. Dick Tarrant. I thought they were going to have enough, though, Indiana, maybe to come back after halftime because Richmond had shot 60%. But Dick Tarrant, T-A-R-R-A-N-T. I remember this guy coaching at Passaic High School, Passaic, New Jersey. Doesn't shock me. He's been a winner from day one. Just a great, great coach. Here's an example. In fact, earlier this year, he beat Georgia Tech on December 22nd. Bobby Kremitz is jumping with joy because it's Revenge City now for Georgia Tech playing Richmond because Richmond had beaten them 73-67. What a shot by Rodney Rice. Hey, I mean, unbelievable. Minute Rice does it. Unbelievable. <laughs> with a minute to go, you like that line, huh? Very often <laughs> what our upsets are things that we have created, of course, and we feel that Richmond beating Indiana is a surprise, whether you call it a major or a minor upset. Right now, we're going to go back to Hartford. Here in Hartford, Richmond 79, Indiana, or 72, Indiana 69. One of the big upsets in the first round so far. And with me is Rodney Rice of the Richmond Spiders. Rodney, congratulations on the win. Your outside shooting in the first half and into the second half was a factor for your club. Well, I know they were going to really be packing it in on Pete and Kratz on the inside. I know I had to hit the outside shot for us to win. Richmond is not a team that gets a whole lot of national recognition. You won your conference then you won the tournament very difficult to do whatever league you're in and now this what's the feeling on the club from the guys you were able to talk to before you came over here well, we're really excited about being in the NCAA tournament you know that was our first goal at the beginning of the season and we wanted to come in here and not only just to be here but win a couple of games now you obviously did the job outside with your outside shooting but talk if you will about Peter Wolfock and Kretzer down deep they did a great job today on Dean Garrett Kretzer's been really hitting the boards lately and Peter he's always our man inside we look for him to score our points but I was glad I was able to hit the outside shot today so is it celebration time and when will you guys start thinking about Georgia Tech we're going to start thinking about Georgia Tech about an hour from now we're going to cool down but we know we have work to do our next game Rodney congratulations on the win thank you Rodney who had Rodney Rice, who had 21 points in the ball game here this afternoon and some outstanding three-point and outside shooting. And the coach is victorious as well. Dan's with him right now. Thanks very much, Bob. And of course, Dick, what can you say? Great win. You did a terrific job. I thought you I thought you took their guards out of the play with the box and one, and, and the tempo really went your way in the second half. I think we had to control tempo in order to win the game. If the game ever got into the 80s and 90s, uh, I'm afraid we were going to run out of gas. As it was, we tired a great deal, but we hung tough as we have all year long. Uh, in, the, in the second half, I thought that Kratz... They failed to do last year in the first round. Lou Hansen trying to wrap it up. free throws. It's 81-69 Illinois leading Texas San Antonio. Cooper just saves it from going out of bounds. Try to pass it. Intercepted by Illinois. Here's Anderson. Gives it up on the break. Gill back to Anderson and a foul. That's going to be over the back on Nick Anderson. They didn't handle that one very well. We wanted a little show time, Tom. I thought Gill was setting Nick Anderson up for a lob dunk situation. Anderson really not ready for it that time. 
Texas that San Antonio four. cut the lead down to nine a couple of times in this half, but Illinois has taken control. Gill puts the pass up there. Anderson not really expecting it. Again, same book. Nine on the season and advance to the second round of the Southeast Regional to play Villanova on Sunday. Final score, Illinois 81, Texas San Antonio 72. Final is 80 to 64. Seton Hall with the victory over Hooray! UTEP. Uh, easy, easy, boy. Let's take a look now at the bracketing in the West as it project ahead, Dick, towards an Arizona Seton Hall matchup. Arizona, of course, top seed Seton Hall coming in number eight. Uh, Seton Hall getting past a UTEP team that really was uh, decimated by a number of problems. Didn't have a lot of uh, other key players, of course. We've talked about that. So let's look ahead towards Sunday. Well, Sunday, they got an unbelievable matchup. You know, the interesting story for Arizona is whether or not Tom Tober can play because yeah. without him, they'll have some problems inside, especially with Mark Bryant. Hey, somebody give a wake-up call to Bryant like after three and a half years? Where's this guy been? He's unbelievable now. Now he's a superstar, and for three and a half years, I didn't know he existed. It's been a perfect day so far for the Big East. Bryant has really increased his stock dramatically with the NBA. Oh, yes, he has. And what about the Big East cash register going uh -huh. ding-a-ling, ding, another the 200,000 in a till. Kind of like uh, you at tax time. is uh -oh. telling up what uh -oh. you've done through the year. NCAA tournament tonight continues. We've got the number one team in the country in just a couple of minutes, the Hall of Winner. Well, we've got the, perhaps the best game of the first round. And in addition, we've got the number one team in the country, Lehigh and Temple. We're going to be spending most of the evening in the insurance city of Hartford, Connecticut. Lehigh and Temple coming up after uh, just a couple of minutes from now. Then about 9.30 Eastern Time, LSU and Georgetown. If you accept the proposition that Temple's going to win tonight, then the winner of this game will be taking on Temple in what will be a corker of a second-round game, and it's an outstanding first-round matchup. Now, Temple and Lehigh, Ronnie Perry and Mike Gorman standing by at the Hartford Civic Center. They'll have tonight's game. All right, Bob Lee, thanks very much. We're just moments away from Temple and Lehigh here in Hartford. And I guess the question, Ron, that a lot of people have been asking the past couple of days is can a team that's ranked number one like Temple has been for almost uh, what, five or six weeks right. now, can they be ready for a team like Lehigh? Well, I think they have to be. And if you listen to their coach, John Chaney, since the season has ended for Temple, regular season and tournament play, that is, and listening to him in press conference time, the first game is the critical game in the NCAA tournament. So he says there will be no letdown. He prides himself on the team approaching things consistently and says this is the first step of another new season. Quickly for Lehigh, we will see a player tonight named Darren Queenan, who we all may see play in the pros for years to come. He's quite a player. Excellent player. You just don't hear a lot about him because he plays in the East Coast Conference for Lehigh, but he's amassed over 2,600 points. That's an awful lot of points. An outstanding player, someone that Temple is very concerned about in this game. All right, Temple feels they need to win a couple to justify getting a Eliminated in the second round the past couple of years for Lehigh. Bob Lee, this could be their night in the century. Back to you. <laughs> and by the way, they are the brown and white officially, even though their warm-ups on the back are going to say engineers. They are trying to change the nickname, want to get a new image, and uh, realize uh, make people realize they are also a liberal arts college as well. The brown and white of Lehigh, the Owls of Temple. We'll check some scores and get you started on the evening action right after this. Temple getting raring to go, number one in the country against Lehigh. Next up, a look at the officials for tonight's game. No one fine on the right. Norm Baruki in the middle and Stanley wrote on the left. The Temple Owls have taken the floor. The Lehigh brown and white. A lot of fans used to hearing Lehigh referred to as the engineers. It is the school that has requested us to call them the brown and white. They're in the process of changing their nicknames mostly because they feel Lehigh is a lot more well-rounded than just an engineering school. So they'll be the brown and white to us tonight, and there are the matchups. Queenan, the player to watch, he will jump center. Queenan and Polaha have scored an amazing amount of points. Something like 6,400 points will graduate when these two leave. I mean, that's a lot of points to be leaving the brown and white next year. Temple with first crack at it. Breezewick, top of the key, Evans. Layer out defensively on him. Tim Perry backs his way in, hits the turnaround. Well, they start out the brown and white doing a man-to-man -man defense, and that's a tough matchup for Cheslock going up against a very rugged Tim Perry. Scott Layer, number 11, will handle the ball a lot. That's Mike Palaha, 24. Queenan down in the right-hand corner, number 12. Queenan with the ball, misses the long jumper. Palaha, an offensive board, but he's stripped by Howard Evans. 
That was Temple's matchup zone, and they're going to try to key on Palaha, number 24, and Darren Queen in number 12. Keenan went downtown for that one. Perry again. Tim takes it in. Little jump hook won't go down. Breezewick's tap won't go, and Lehigh able to clear. Grant McCaffrey felt the key in staying close in this ballgame for Lehigh was doing a job off the glass. Russell kicks it out to Palaha. Leo will try a three. Macon rebounding and running. Mark Macon, hesitation, good pass. Perry's got two more. One thing that Lehigh is doing with those two quick jump shots is they're creating perhaps a faster tempo in this game than they want. Now Leo will pull it out just a bit. Lehigh looking to break the ice. Missing outside. Breeze with the rebound. Palaha can't keep it alive. And Perry gives it off to Evans. So three shots by Lehigh. Three threes attempted. That's right. There's only been one opportunity each time. Breezewick missing the three. Good hustle play there as Cheslaw kept it alive. Lair has got Queenan on a wing. Takes it himself. And an offensive foul is called. He had Queenan up on the left wing ahead of him. Brand McCaffrey gets up to question the call. Now, Vrieswick got pretty good position on that one. Layer should have pulled up around the foul line area, either taking the short jump shot or perhaps throwing the bounce pass over to Queenan. First foul on Layer, the first on Lehigh. Macon flashes through the middle. Too long with the jumper. A nice boxing out again underneath by Bill Chesla. Clips in the white. Let's join Mick Hubert and Jack Gibbons in this game. First half. Of the NCAA. Any use of this program without written consent is prohibited. The announcers for this program have been approved and contracted by NCAA Productions. A busy day of basketball. And Seton Hall has defeated Utah 80 to 64. That's out west and in the Midwest, Vanderbilt knocks off Utah State from the PCAA 80 to 77 for CM Newton's team. Archer controlling for Maryland. I really like the job Santa Barbara has done at uh, cutting cutting down the chances of Maryland on the inside. They have really posted, got on those post-up people to uh, force them force Maryland to shoot the ball from the outside. Possession arrow is toward uh, Santa Barbara. The Gauchos will get it. Nine forty remaining in the first half. Carlton Davenport being guarded by Rudy Archer. Old court number 12, Ryan Johnson. Oh, Davenport is a, is a true playmaker. He is capable of getting the ball to the right people at the right time. You saw him right there find the opening down low to make the pass. So a Maryland foul. He'll be out of bounds to UC Santa Barbara. Each team with three first half fouls. Ryan Shaw working against Steve Hood. Davenport came to the lane to get that ball, and he's got it on the rim and in. Well, a good job and good body control that time by Davenport. Only six foot tall and took the ball in there to right at uh, Brian Williams. Williams couldn't get up high enough to get this, get the hand on it. Derek Lewis inside. Oh. We'll be keeping an eye on that game throughout the entire evening. Temple cannot really shake the brown and white as right now that game is still a tight one in Hartford. We'll take a break and then get right back to the action in Connecticut. Breezewick launches a three. Picked off by Lair. Lehigh now a chance to take the final shot of the half. If they can hit a three, would have a tie game. Now the smart thing for Lehigh would be to take the shot with about five seconds left and just try to make the last shot because they've been only getting one shot for most of this first half. Polaha watches the clock. Breezewick comes out at him. Temple's adjusted to a man-to-man. -man. Makes it more difficult to hold the ball. Ten seconds. Polaha wants to go himself. Great move on Breezewick. Walk it down for him. Picked off by Macon. Watches the clock. Let's it fly. Almost got it. What a half. John Chaney heads to the locker room. That's the end of the first half. 
with the score. Temple 38, Lehigh 35. We'll be back. Uh, let's go back in time a little bit about what, uh, 48 minutes ago, and you said what? They have absolutely no chance. Started singing the impossible dream to the consternation of music teachers of America. <laughs> all right, what do we got here? Hey, let me tell you something. First of all, the bottom line is you got to win. It's not moral victories that count. First of all, look at Temple all year long. One point win over Penn State. Struggle with Mississippi. When it's all said and done, the W will be on the Temple side. Let me tell you something else. They're trying to make it interesting, saving it for the next night. If they were to beat Temple, all right. I'll hitchhike from here to Hartford, all right. down the road, all right. and I will offer to drive the bus for Lehigh back to Bethlehem. Ooh, gosh. I don't know. You at the wheel? They may not want to <laughs> win this game. All right. Plug in your ears so you can hear what we're doing, and let's get back to reviewing what's been happening through the evening. They've just now gone to halftime in Cincinnati, the game between the Gauchos of Santa Barbara and Maryland. A seesaw first half. Let's take a look at what's been happening in that game between the Terps and the Gauchos. Teams playing well both ends of the floor. Keith Gantlin had the hot hand for the Terps. Scores on the backdoor pass from Scott Williams here. Gantlin. Halfway through this game, has got 17 points. But Brian Shaw, one of the great unsung players, with 14 points in the first half. The PCAA Player of the Year, 44-39 is the halftime score. And they, as we said, have just now gone to the intermission. We'll be tracking that uh, game tonight with live reports and score updates through the night. Elsewhere today, in the Southeast earlier today, the Illini over the Roadrunners of San Antonio, 81-72. Lowell Hamilton had 21 in that game. Glenn Blackwell had 19. Illinois will be playing... The team from Villanova, the win 82-74, as Nova has yet to lose a first-round tournament game under Roley Massimino. They are now 22-12, and 12, a good day for Doug West, as Villanova shot 57% from the floor on the day. Game that uh, ended a several hours ago, the first visit ever for the Seton Hall Pirates in the tournament against the UTEP Miners, and the Bear Don Haskins has seen many a tournament. Miners up by one here, but James Major for three, and the Pirates have an advantage. Seton Hall takes a four-point advantage. Watch here as Major will drive the lane. It won't go, but Mark Bryant, who had 30 on the day, puts it home. He had 12 of those 30 in the first half, and at the intermission, Seton Hall by four. UTEP hanging in. After down, being down by 10, Chris Sandal with that home run. And it's a one-point lead for the Hall. Sandal had 28. But the Pirates were able to pull away. They're up by eight. Mark Bryant in the paint. What a close to the regular season. And now the postseason he has had. P.J. Carlissimo and the Pirates move on as Don Haskins heads back to El Paso. That final was by the count of 80 to 64. And after the game, we talk with P.J. Carlissimo. The kids were very loose, fortunately. I think they just came out and they've been really loose and confident the whole year. And I think, I don't think they appreciate it yet. I think if you hear it a couple times, you start thinking, hey, this is really important. When it's here for the first time, you come out and you enjoy it, and that's the way they're playing. But in terms of getting it in the mark, I thought the other people did a real good job. El Paso does a super job of pressuring, but they just aren't manned right now. They don't have enough people. So if you make a couple more passes, eventually, you know, any team has to get tired. And I think that the other kids did a good job involving Mark in the offense. Final is 80-64. to 64. P.J. Carlissimo coaching today with a bad case of the flu. Normally, he doesn't have much of a voice when the game's over. So, 80-64, to 64 and everywhere, sons of Mother Seton, rather proud of this victory. The first foray ever into the NCAA tournament for the Seton Hall Pirates. In fact, uh, Dick, a moment of pride here, huh? Let's take a look. Do we have that? Uh, yeah. There it is. Who owns those rings? That's my ring on the left. And mine on the right. Okay, we've gotten that out of our blood because we better get it out of the way quickly. At Sunday, it's going to be Seton Hall against... Arizona, Arizona against Cornell. It was a workout today and the easy victory by the count of 90 to 50. Anthony Cook had 24 points. Arizona is 32 and 2 and they get past the first round. They lost the last three rounds early on in the tournament, so Arizona moves along with that easy win. We are at the halftime of a curious game. The brown and white. Well, we'll call them the engineers. They're engineering an interesting game right now. They're down three on the Temple Owls, number one in the country. Stay with us can do against number one Temple. Hartford, Connecticut, and the score, Temple 38, and Lehigh 35. Let's take a look at the first half numbers in this very, very surprising first round game. And if you told me, Ron Perry, that Lehigh would shoot 39% in the half and trail by just three, I would have told you enough. <laughs> Only reason I can even believe it is when you look at these numbers and see that Temple hasn't shot the ball much better and that Lehigh has held their own on the boards in this first half. We've got 18 for each team, and a couple of those extra threes by Lehigh, they're right in it. 
And if it wasn't for Mark Macon, Temple might not be right in this game. What a half this kid had. Well, he took matters into his own hands. Had 18 first half points, and when things stalled offensively, they got him the ball, and he stuck it. You see, Mark Macon just a brilliant half. Eight rebounds in the first half. That's officially looked like he had a whole lot more. <laughs> On the other side, Darren Queen, and we'll talk about Mike Palaha, though, kind of took over late in the half for Lehigh. Right. He'd only gotten one shot off through about 15 minutes, and then hit a couple of shots and then made that fine runner in the lane and he can put the points there quickly too. He finished the half with seven points and five rebounds. Let's take a look. Individual scoring for both teams. Queen is leading the way. He's got 12. He needs 26 tonight, by the way, to move past Reggie Lewis, who's ex of Northeastern University, now at the Boston Celtics, and that would put him up into 10th all-time in the NCAA scoring list. And on the other side for Temple, it has been the Mark Macon show. 18 points for Mark and no fouls. Howard Evans with seven, then Tim Perry, two fouls, sat down early, didn't come back. Rieswick has been able, unable to get it going. No real big help off the bench. Rivas, who you would think has a terrific mismatch in his favor, only got two in the first half. Is this a fairy tale we're in uh, halfway through here, Ron, or what? Well, if, if Temple waits too long to turn on the gas, this is a team and I think an atmosphere which could build in Lehigh's favor. I think they picked some confidence up in the first half, did Lehigh, because they hung in there with Temple. But Temple has been a team all year long that has won games. They have just won them one after the other with the exception of one game to UNLV. So Lost that by a point. They're playing with fire, though, if they let Lehigh stick around too long. Rand McCaffrey right. hoping that they can stick around just about half hour more. He'd be pretty happy. Rivas, Evans, Macon, Perry, and Breezewick come back out for Temple. Mike Polaha, Scott Lair, Tim Russell, Bill Cheslock, and Darren Queenan back on the floor for the brown and white of Lehigh. Lehigh with a chance to get a little bit closer here. Blair, number 11, hit some threes early in the game. In fact, he hit three of them. Queenan running the baseline. Blair looks for him in the corner. Now they come top to Russell. Little opening, he takes it. Back rims it, Perry the rebound. Perry was up there all by himself on that board. Beginning moments in his second half important to establish momentum. We see who can take charge right here. John Chaney kept his team in the locker room until there was one minute on the clock. Temple came out and shot for about 20 seconds, and that was it. Tim Perry with his sixth point of the night. Well, I have to imagine he was getting a couple of points across rather strongly. I don't know if he raised his voice or not. All he had to do was look at the stat sheet, look at the shooting, and talk a little bit about intensity to his ball club. Darren Queenan has it slapped away by Mark Macon. What a player this freshman is. Doesn't change the expression on his face. Never. Knows what he's got to do out there. Here players talk about focusing on a game. Mark Macon focuses better than most. Queenan down the lane for two. Well, he's been at his best in this game. Queenan has he's penetrated to the goal. He's very explosive. Lays with a smile on his face, too. I like that. He's having a good time. Yeah, he really is. Ron Franklin along with Quinn Buckner. And right now, with a minute 38 seconds left until halftime, the Ohio Valley Conference representative, a three-point lead over NC State. McClatchy inside, and it's a five-point lead. Well, that was a good play inside. I got the ball, took it around, and saw the help coming from North Carolina State. Uh, Charles Shackles, he just dished it off. And McClatchy got an easy pass, and they got a five-point lead. Monroe, two-pointer, just inside the line. That's nine points for him off the bench. The average is 11, and he's off and running here this evening in Lincoln. About to go into one minute until halftime. Murray State has done a good job for themselves. They're right here in this basketball game. As you see McClatchy make a shot, something that he doesn't normally do for them. That's one of those shots that the coach screams to the bench, no great shot, isn't that right? Exactly. <laughs> I'm a great coach when that goes in. <laughs> Del Negro gets it back with 44 seconds until halftime. You know, if the, the shot clock is at the point now that North Carolina State can go for one shot, but a half a tick difference. Shackelford misses, and he has been pulled in this first half. Shack with five points. Biggest lead of the night, the five-pointer by Murray State. And off 
obviously Coach Newton with one finger high in the air, and that's not play number one. He wants to go for the final one here at halftime. Game against Del Negro. That's man. I guess he's going to take the shot. Interesting thing. There's man. 25 footer. Not there on the follow. NC State. One second. Monroe could not get it off on time. So they head to the locker room. And I just want to ask you, Quinn, how surprised are you at this? Is that and our thanks to Ron Franklin and Quinn Buckner there in Lincoln. We'll be updating you on that one. Temple's got things in control now against Lehigh. Here's Mike Gorman in Hartford. 340 now to go here in the game. Temple by nine. Macon playing with the four fouls. Reesworth playing with four fouls. Evans playing with four fouls. Inside to Perry. He's been the story and he hits again. Now that's 27 now for Tim Perry. And that's the kind of basket that now makes it a double-digit game. 11-point Temple lead makes it tough for the for Lehigh. Palaha knocks a three down. <laughs> he doesn't have any quit in him. 22 for Palaha, and Lehigh takes a timeout. And with the timeout on the court, the score Temple 74, Lehigh 66. Down low, 10 of 13. And Jimmy Russell, who has had himself... A valiant night here trying to stop the likes of Tim Perry down low. Russell playing with a swollen cheek. There you see the left side of his face where he caught an elbow from Ramon Rivas earlier. But Russell won't take no for an answer and he's back out there playing. I think that kind of typifies the way Lehigh's played all night long. Say, that's the story of this Lehigh team. As you see, both teams with three timeouts left and the possession arrow favors Temple. East Coast Conference with a lot to be proud of here tonight. Temple, of course, an original member of that East Coast Conference until they left to join the Atlantic 10. Right, Lafayette, Ryder, Drexel, Bucknell and company proud of what they're seeing here on the part of Lehigh. And they might have to go out and get Temple a little bit here. John Cheney with all that foul trouble will let him take it down. 12 on the shot clock right now. Get it in the hands of Macon. Macon the spin. Knocks it down. I guess you could say he's not afraid to take the big one and the smart one because Temple worked the clock well. 24 for Macon. Block outside to Palaha. Gets away from Macon. A leader. Yes! Score it in a foul. That might be a four-point play. I think it might have been. Everyone with the arms up. No, it's check. Good teamwork by the officials. The trail official on the weak side said no way. We all there's the left foot right on the line. Nice call. Good, good call, guys. We've seen that a few times today. Real good work where one of the refs picks up the foul. They look for help on what they need, and they get it. Mike Palaha finishing off a brilliant career here at Lehigh. He and Darren Queenan have combined for 43. And Mark Macon leaves the game. 24 points, 9 rebounds. And uh, Dick Tarrant joins us live in our studio here this evening. And Dick, congratulations on the victory. Thank you, Bob. Was it your biggest as a coach at Richmond? Well, perhaps. Uh, it certainly parallels our, our win over Auburn, mainly because they're NC2A wins. And, and uh, we've had some great wins, but when they're in a the national tournament, they're more meaningful. Dick, I try to tell everybody I knew you back then when I was only in <laughs> high school following your teams. Yeah. What do these names mean? Mike Check and Dick <laughs> Martini, John Mahanchek, Roland Moss, Michael Glaus. I could go on and on. I used to sneak in your gym and watch it. And learn the nation doesn't realize that if you would have gotten a chance earlier in your career you'd be up there with the Knights and the Dean Smiths that didn't happen so I mean let's not even talk about it but those names uh, are very important to me and, and I still hear from those guys and and they're a very important part of my life and I hope that I had some maybe minor influence to help them along in getting on to adulthood. Dick, did you feel frustrated at all and that you didn't get a chance until you're 50 years of age in terms of being a head coach, watching all the years, guys that maybe were inferior to you? No, no, no I mean, I, I really didn't have a drive to be a college coach until all of a sudden it was thrust upon me. You know, it was a one-year kind of an interim coach thing, and my back was to the wall, and I decided to roll up my sleeves and do what I had to do. But uh, I'm very, very happy at Richmond, and... I'm particularly delighted tonight, not only to be with you, Dick, but, but to uh, have, have won a game against a, a team as prestigious as Indiana program and a, a man I respect, of course, enormously as Bob Knight. I'll tell you, Dick, that respect certainly is mutual. Let's take a look now at Bob Knight's responses and his thoughts after the game as the Hoosiers were dethroned this afternoon by Richmond. 
this is the third time now that we've played Richmond uh, in a tournament. And, and I think I, and hell, Dick Tarrant was a good coach before I ever started coaching. Uh, and, and if I were to pick uh, a guy, if somebody were to say to me, pick the best coaches in the country or the people that have done the best jobs with basketball programs, Dick Tarrant would be one of them, one of the handful, uh, simply because there isn't any real reason why Richmond should be any good in basketball. They weren't ever very good before he got there, but he's done a great job developing the people that he's had, and he certainly doesn't have the opportunity to recruit like a, as a school like ours does, and so he's done an outstanding job with it. What do your kids think about when they play a, a name, major name school like this? Well, I, I just try to uh, tell the guys that it's, you're not playing the name, you're just playing some guys you might play in a playground. Now, Keith Smart and, and, and Garrett and those guys are outstanding, uh, probably future NBA guys, but um, we just have to stay together as a team and, and our roles and our chemistry and, and think of what we can do as a group. I said, after all, you guys upset Auburn when they had Barkley in person. If someone, if someone said that now, that. your knees would bang together. I mean, they're two of the most, they're two all-pro guys. So a lot can be done uh, in a college game if you, uh, if you play together and you use the clock and do all the things you have to do to, to win. And that was, I think, evidence today in that great win for us. Dick, I know all your peers, guys that know basketball, have seen you at clinics, uh, echo what Bob said, that you're certainly recognized as really an outstanding coach. I have a quick question for you. The phone rings, it's outside, it's Fred Gruninger, Rutgers University. You're from New Jersey. Would you make that one last trip, come back to the State University, and be the head coach? Well, uh, Fred hasn't called. <laughs> and, and should he call, I, I think I'd just tell him I'm very, very happy at Richmond, and I, I plan to stay there. My, my family is there. My, I have uh, children and grandchildren in Richmond, and I do not plan to go to Rutgers. Someone called from a New Jersey paper as soon as Craig Littlepage resigned or was dismissed or what have you. And maybe I didn't say the right thing, but I said, New Jersey's a nice place to be from. You know, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe they didn't come take on, that. Well, well, the, 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 the three of Bob us get a test on that, yeah, certainly. Whoa, well, Dick, Richie. you know, he's been calling me Richie. <laughs> yeah. Richie. I, I, I remember when you didn't have this perm, baby. I, I remember uh, you when you had holes in your shoes. <laughs> Nonetheless, we, we heard what Bob Knight said, certainly, about the, the reputation that Dick Tarrant has established for himself at Richmond. Earlier today at that same press conference, somebody asked Bob Knight whether, indeed, Bob had had a chance in person this year to scout the Richmond Spiders. How the hell would I get from Bloomington to Richmond during basketball season to watch a game? Or for what reason? You know, I think Terrence a hell of a coach, but the son of a bitch isn't my brother. I mean... He's As only he can work. say it, right? Oh, he's, he's, he's a piece of work. I'll tell you one thing. Why, why would he come to Richmond to see us play anymore and we'd go to Indiana to see them play? We don't have the foggiest idea, one, if we're getting in, and two, who we're going to play. Hey, to change the subject, you got Georgia Tech. You beat him earlier in the year, Bobby Kremens. He's got to like the idea of rather playing. I'm sure he's rather play oh, you than Indiana right now. The yeah. fact they're playing the second time, what would you have to do to beat that club again? Well, I, I think we have to control tempo. They're really getting it up and down much, much better than when we played them in December. So I think we have to really um, take time off the clock, Richie, and make that 40-minute uh, game into a 30-minute game and see if we can control tempo and keep the game in the 60s. If it gets into the 80s and 90s or in the 100s, then it's, it's history. You talk about the many things that can happen in the college game. You dethroned the champion today, Dick. Let's take a look back in history over the last five champions that we've had in the NCAA ranks, what they have done. Now, North Carolina State, the miracle year next year. NIT loses there in the first round. Georgetown, yes, of course, got back in 85 and lost to Villanova in that miracle game. But Villanova's miracle 85 season, they followed that up by losing in the second round. Louisville did not get the bid after winning in 86. And Indiana goes out in the first round. That really highlights the, the miracles that can occur in the majesty of this game. And you, you again proved it today. And uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, oh, Dick Terry. I'm, I'm a big ESPN fan. And I'm a, it's a pleasure to be here in Bristol with you guys. I want to thank you, too. And I'll tell you thank something. You. We use that word great, I know, for a lot of coaches. And I mean this sincerely. I've been saying it about you a long time. You know that this guy can flat out coach. There's no doubt about it. He's a star and a coach and professional. I'm proud thank of you, big guy. Thank you very much. Throwing Richard. Rutgers around. There's a guy who played at Rutgers. His team is in trouble right now. We're talking about Jimmy Valvano. We say March is made for miracles. Murray State's up by 11. Whoa. We'll be checking in on Whoa. that game. We've got more scores and highlights. Thanks again, Dick. Good luck to Richmond. Final score tonight, Temple over Lehigh. We continue with LSU and Georgetown straight ahead. Welcome back. I'm Bob Lee, the NCAA tournament tonight. But if you talk about March being made for miracles, how about a seesaw game between Murray State and NC State, Ron Franklin? 
from Lincoln, Nebraska. Rob Franklin along with Quinn Buckner. 57 to 52, the same margin at halftime. Murray stayed on top, and Jet Martin has just dropped in his 21st point of the evening. The all-everything player in the Ohio Valley Conference this year proving exactly why in this one tonight. He came in averaging over 26, and he has 21 points in this one, 11 in the second half. Brown all of a sudden has caught fire. He had the two at halftime, and now all of a sudden it gives him 10. And, well, he's doing a good job of taking over inside. The first half, he's shooting those jump shots. That's not going to help North Carolina State. He needs to get out on the block. He has more height. He's a great jumper. and just shoot over people on the Murray State basketball team. You heard me talk about that uh, screen just a moment ago. Asias misses from outside. Ogden is the man who uh, held the screen up. As man couldn't get that ball to hold its head up, and it uh, caromed out. Boy, the crowd really groaned, and Corciano, that time they were talking to him as he came down. Man comes down with the basketball. Wisely holds the ball out a little bit. I think he's starting to get a little bit tired, as a matter of fact. So Don Man brings the ball, slows it down. Now they've got to take their time, get it to Jeff Martin, and let him start doing some scoring. Man, spin move along the baseline. Great move. Don Mann with his 14th point, his first two of the second half, and a foul as they come down very quickly in transition. And Mann is... What a game. Murray State and North Carolina State will be checking back in on that one and getting back to it throughout the balance of the evening and getting back to Lincoln, taking a look at that Kansas. one. We got more... He's a high-profile, in-demand basketball coach with an enviable track record. Oh. Hi, guys. But here in a Midwestern donut shop, this Long Island native finds a sense of peace and contentment. I grew up um, on top of my grandfather's bakery, and uh, you know he was he was pretty awesome. But uh, you know, Carolee's Carolee's gotten us over some rough spots. Uh, my dogs like the, their donuts, and um, but I like the fellowship there. The numbers begin to tell the Larry Brown story. He has won everywhere that he's coached. I want to win badly. Um, I want us to be the very best program. I've been disappointed in the fact that um, there is so much mention about me leaving all the time. But I, hell, I've been here five years, and uh, I know a lot of coaches that have moved a lot more than me that they never even talk about it. You know, I, I really honestly would hope that someday people would focus on whether I could coach or not whether I cared about the kids, whether I did a good job. Um, that would be something that I'd really feel proud about. The hottest rumor on the basketball tour now has Brown leaving Lawrence to work for old friend Carl Shear at the NBA expansion Charlotte Hornets. I don't know if I could handle this, and I doubt I could. Um, but I don't ever want to be in that position. Um, you know, I doubt that a Dean Smith or a Bobby Knight or John Thompson, people that I have a great deal of respect for, would, would consider that as an alternative. Job rumors and Larry Brown. The two seem married, but he denies any soul searching over an impending departure from Lawrence, Kansas. I haven't been struggling with the decision, you know. Um, I had a press conference last year um, and said I was staying. Uh, I didn't realize I have to come out every day with another another statement about my staying or not. You know, five years is a commitment, I think, that I've made that has shown the fact that I have every intention of staying. I think when people speculate about me going to Charlotte, then they have basis for that because that's one spe special place. But I've heard my name mentioned to five or six places, and I, I think then it becomes silly after a while. And, so I have every intention of seeing Vital clean now and feel it. State, North Carolina State. Let's take you back to the beginning of that game with North Carolina State number three seed in this region in the Midwest. Kelsey Weems picks off the pass and an eight-point lead for NC State. But the Racers race back. Don Mann, look out. That's a three, and the Racers are up by three, up by five at halftime. Wolfpack coming on back. Shaq takes it to the rack, gets it out to Rodney Monroe for three. 
Now the Wolfpack only down by four. Jim Valvano, yeah, he's directing traffic, but the racers, Chris Ogden gets this offensive rebound, puts it back up. He was a clutch player down the stretch. Inside a minute, the racers by four. Seven seconds to go. Paul King makes the free throw, and the racers are up by three. It's 78-75. But he has one more attempt coming. He misses the rebound to Del Negro. The three to tie the game, and it doesn't go. And Steve Newton and the Racers with the upset over the Wolfpack. That final score, 78-75. to So North Carolina State knocked out last year in the first round. Same thing happens in 1988. Hey, is Steve Newton the brother of Fig Newton? No, and what about nor Isaac? Sir Isaac. Neither. No, neither sir one. Isaac no, the either. racers have raced their first trips in 69. They've done a number. Hey, think about this. Last right. year at Ohio Valley Conference, Austin P. over right. Illinois. They say bye-bye. Tonight they say bye-bye. Jimmy V, go eat your lasagna. Vitals boys to the shower. I'll tell you one thing. Jim Delaney of the Ohio Valley Conference commissioner, who used to play at North Carolina, has to be ecstatic doing a little dance right now. now I'm going to jump on your case, Stop pal. Me. I didn't come close Stop to you. Me. You've been a great advocate of, of talking about how the best 64 on here. North Carolina A&T out of the Mideastern gives Syracuse a major scare. Lehigh does the same thing tonight to number one Temple. I think the formula that's in place works okay. It may not be the best 64 teams, but right now they're playing like it. Well, I'll tell you one thing. These clubs have played like a top 64. However, I think if you use the computer and come out with the best 64, that's the way to go. And if they're one of the top 64 at Murray State, maybe they'll chart out to be one of the best. They deserve to be in. Cannot convince me any other way. I'm a stubborn little paisan. Don't you understand that? Oh, I know that all too well. <laughs> a couple of that. 19 more free throws by LSU than the Hoyas here tonight. And LSU can be a good free throw shooting team late in the game. They'll hit roughly three or four when it gets below two minutes. Yeah, and, that, and that's really the key figure right there is how do you shoot it when the game's on the line. Georgetown, of course, has had a lot of problems shooting the ball. Dale Brown with the timeout. Look for him to call a special play on the timeout now. And also with a stat sheet. Don't think those coaches don't know who the good free throw shooters are out there. That's yeah. what he was glancing at. Georgetown four and three in close games. LSU three and one in similar situations. Georgetown extending the defense more. Oh, they get right up on you. Pretty good shot there. Boy, they really left Sims open. And this game is tied. 16 for the freshman, 63 all. First time we've been tied since 4 to 4. And Thompson will spend his second time out. 37 seconds remaining. A pause on the court. Iowa wins the track meet against Florida State in L.A. They do it 102-98. B.J. Armstrong had 35 in that game. Just over three minutes now. Kentucky up by 18, 92-74 on Southern. We are going right down to the wire. Let's get back to Bob and Dan. 16 points and seven rebounds. We talked about how well he played in the SEC tournament with 14 against Kentucky. He was 9 of 15 in the tournament. Georgetown going to try to run it all the way down, Bob, now with 30 seconds left in the game. Now let's get within six feet. If they get within six feet, you know they're going to start the count, but they're not. They're going to sit back. Georgetown made a 13-0 run. LSU now has answered 22-12. A real game of streaks. And a lot of pressure on the LSU defense right now. Charles Smith another. has not scored in the second half. He simply holds the ball till nine seconds remain, and John Thompson has spent his third timeout. Dale Brown's got to be saying to himself right now, let's see, what kind of defense now do you come back out with? Do we switch up, go man-to-man -man with nine seconds remaining on the clock, or we drop back and play the zone? They might switch up on him and maybe give him a little different look. Well, the NCAA conducting research during the tournament. Would you like to see more women's basketball on TV? If yes, 900-260-2221. If your answer is at about this hour, right now, it's John Thompson, Dale Brown, the Hoyas, and the Tigers. Nine seconds left in regulation. Smith will throw it in, and LSU wants a timeout. So it's still 63-63. Nine seconds left. We'll be back to Hartford in just a moment. going to take so much time off the clock like he did without any kind of pressure. What he's saying is if you can beat us with the last shot, you're going to win the basketball game. Now, do you take a shot with what? Five or four, maybe get the offensive board, maybe? Well, you're going to take it right down the wire because it's an overtime game. It's not like you're down one and you want to get it back. Let's see the game come down to its conclusion. Timeout huddles are broken. 
Dale Brown, John Thompson. And Dan, you feel that number 13, Charles Smith, is the key man for Coach Thompson in this situation. Well, I thought that Smith may penetrate with the ball, and I did feel that LSU might change it up and go a little man-to-man. -man. Maybe they're going to show man-to-man -man and drop back in the zone. But they're trying to keep it away from Smith. They couldn't do it. Smith time spent on the exchange. Three, two, he let it go in time. saw what it meant to John Thompson, that that brush of emotion of his, and uh, the three, and uh, Smith was sitting there watching it happen. Well, how come you're on my case when I don't call one? Now, when I call one, you don't give me any credit. I don't I get... know, Bob Lee. You're not supposed to be, you're supposed to be my buddy. Uh, I am your buddy. But hey, that, uh, all right, intense game, certainly, in, a, in an appropriate way for those two teams to go right down to the nub. Heartbreaking loss for uh, LSU, but they've had so many wins over the years in terms of uh, games that were miracles that they did pull out in the Dale Brown era. And I think when you look at it right now, they've been a very lucky team to be in the NCAA tournament. I mean, this is not a vintage Georgetown team. However, in a one-game situation with Temple right now, I really believe Georgetown's the kind of club that can give them all kinds of problems. Let's face it, this is Hail Mary time right here, Bob. Not really a great shot by Charles Smith. Clock coming down. Now here it goes. He's going to kiss it off the glass. And he says, that's exactly the way I wanted to do it as they celebrate in Hoyerland. Putting it down for the three. And so Georgetown with the victory over LSU. Now we've got plenty more games coming your way. They all happen to be uh, replays of games that have been played already or are in action at this hour. It gets underway at 1.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Xavier and Kansas will be in action. Arizona and Cornell follows at 3.30 in the morning Eastern Time, 12.30 Pacific Time. Iowa takes on Florida State. It'll be 5.30 in the morning. Set your VCRs. Don't stay up all night like Dick will at his hotel. Kentucky and Southern, 7.30 Eastern Time. Then Georgia Tech. And Iowa State, 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, just in front of Pee Wee's Playhouse. You'll have a chance to take a look at that game. Now, to take you quickly around what's been happening tonight, NCAA tournament tonight. Southern and Kentucky, moments ago, a final as Kentucky has polished off the victory over Southern by the count of 99 to 84. Xavier and Kansas are in action. Kansas has pretty much had its way in this game, this game being played at the Midwest in Lincoln, Nebraska. Xavier, of course, out of the Midwestern Collegiate Conference. Kansas in command of this game, up 18, with just now 90 seconds, we understand, to go in the first half of that game. Surprise of the evening has been North Carolina State sent packing by Murray State as Coach Steve Newton's team knocks NC State out of the tournament in the first round. Vanderbilt this afternoon over Utah State, 80-77, Purdue, and Cornette did the job up front. Pittsburgh awaits uh, Vandy because they had the win over Eastern Michigan, 108-90. Smith had 31 in that game. Iowa and Florida State, a very tense game at Pauley Pavilion tonight. B.J. Armstrong had 35. Iowa wins it by 4, 102-98. Seton Hall makes its maiden appearance in the tournament, wins over UTEP by 16. They'll play Arizona because Arizona boffed uh, Cornell 90-50 by 40 points. Anthony Cook had 24 in that game. Richmond, the surprise of the afternoon, dethroning Indiana 72-60. 69 on a Rodney Rice jumper inside 55 seconds in that game. Georgia Tech is the next team for the Spiders. They knocked off Iowa State by 12. Temple got a big-time Major League scare from Lehigh tonight. Wins it by 14. It was not that much of a spread in the game, actually. Tim Perry, 27 points. He was the difference. Maryland over UCSB by 10, as Derek Lewis had 25 in that game. The fighting Illini in the Southeast. Moving on, of course, uh, into the second round. Lowell Hamilton had 21 points. He's out of Chicago. Had a great game. Nine points the win. And they'll take on Villanova with the win over Arkansas. Doug West had 22 points. And that's where we stand with the scores of the day. What's been your, your most vivid impression of this tournament? I think we started looking at this yesterday afternoon, wondering if the parity that we have uh, seen through the year would be 
in this tournament. I No doubt about it, it's here. Well, there's no question. We've been talking about that magical word, uh, unpredictability, parity all year long from day one, from some of the first games we've had. And you see it now with Murray State and Richmond, two of the heavyweights in coaching. When you talk about tournament time, you talk James T. Valvano, Robert Montgomery Knight. They'll be on a sideline, and the names now really belong to a Newton and to a Tarrant, who now take over into the spotlight and the limelight. But that's the, the beauty of NCAA basketball. Give me NCAA basketball over anything, Robert Lee. I'll tell you, nine great years I've had to work with you. Let's hope Ooh. we're back for number 10 well, next year. If uh, the creek don't rise, let's ask you one final question. We've agreed going in that uh, we saw Arizona as the champion. Has anything changed? A look at Purdue, maybe? or a look at Arizona against Cornell to change your mind? Well, Arizona scares me now without Tom Tolbert. If they don't have Tolbert, you can't afford to lose a quality player at this time of the year and to be able to go all the way. We don't know about the condition of Tolbert. I love that team. I love the coaching job of Lute Olson and certainly the courageousness of Steve Kerr and the greatness of Sean Elliott. Yeah. But Purdue got a great yeah. basketball team as well. We'll see you in Kansas City. Of course, we'll have complete Sports Center coverage in Kansas City the entire week. Sports Center is next up. For Dick Vitale and John Saunders, I'm Bob Lee. We leave you with a look at the people and the emotions and the moments of this day in the tournament. Whoopee! Unbelievable! Everybody, this is the final game of the first round of the 1988 NCAA basketball tournament. Tonight at Southwest Missouri State, seated 13th, against the number four seed, UNLV. Now, earlier today, here in the West region, Arizona advanced by beating Cornell in a mismatch, 90 to 50. Seton Hall moved on, and in game three, Iowa won a ticket to Sunday's game and will play the winner of our game here tonight. And hello again, everybody. I'm Tim Brandt. And the big question being asked here in the West is how good is Southwest Missouri State? And where is it? Well, it's 185 miles south of Kansas City. This is the sixth year playing Division I basketball, but SMSU's most famous graduate is not a basketball player, but a movie star, Kathleen Turner. Yet one year ago, the Bears got the attention of the entire nation by upsetting Clemson in the first round. A stroke of coaching genius by Charlie Spoonauer. We had no clue what we were doing last year. Coaches, players, fans, we were absolutely clueless. Well, we've got some idea now, at least, what we're doing, and uh, it makes it better. He's dumb like a fox, and there she is, the number one graduate, Kathleen Turner. And working with me tonight is Bill Raftery. And Bill, when you look at these two teams, well, there's a contrast in styles. Well, the cities, too. Of course, Tark, the bright lights, the fast lane, and the strip. That approach 
But Charlie Spooner with the laid back, the old country boy, the ah shucks look, but they get it done as well. But the interesting thing, the Tark, the players were tired. They were, they were almost as tired as his eyes at the end of the year. So he gave them a few days off. And of course, they had other problems at the end of the year as well. We, we lost nine of the 12 guys from last year's ball club, seven out of our top nine players. So this is really a new basketball team. And we were really pleased with uh, the way we were playing earlier in the year. And now, obviously, we're disappointed because we have slept off. And, and we hope that we're going to really make a good showing here. They sound like a couple of medicine men, but they both think they have the right prescription. Hey, now you talked about tired legs. Southwest Missouri State has played only two games in the last 21 days. Well rested, but that could be a problem for them as well. All right, we're all set in the West, and we'll show you how the West is won. We'll have the starting lineups right after this. Stay with us. CBS Sports coverage of today's NCAA Basketball Championship first round game from Los Angeles is sponsored by Extra Gold in Bottles and Cans. It's new, it's draft. UPS, for overnight delivery from coast to coast, UPS runs the tightest ship in the shipping business. And by Sterling, the inevitable British road car. Great ability to gather. The Bears sticking to a man-to-man -to -man defense. Nice pass inside. Patio gets away with a walk. Now he's called for a charge. And that's Patio's second personal foul. Patio trying to force things a little bit. A lot of people here looking for him. He's got to play under control. Stacey Ogden to get some things done. He's got a tough matchup. Keith Jackson's got to guard him. They should be able to get something inside. Clay Holt looked for the three-pointer. Now is in a little bit of a trouble. Pretty good step under player. Good outside shooter. Gets you up in the air. Keith Jackson to Holt. Oh, not a good one. Numbers are there. Three on two. And talking to the Vegas followers, the real struggle, they're not running the break well. They're not finishing it off. They don't have the outstanding leadership at the point. That was smart that time sure by Ruby James pulled up at the foul line in Camden. This is, that's from your era. Stop at the foul line or you'll be taken out. That's correct. Look at this. Should no wipe bucket. The goal. Should wipe the goal out. Good no ball. bucket. Charge on nice the Nice They had cleaned out the backside. Right here, the step in. Instead of playing host to the beloved Tar Heels, arch rival Duke used the Dean Dome to play its first round tournament game. Back home in Durham, the Blue Devil fans are known for their offbeat makeup, emotional and otherwise. Not surprisingly, when they invaded Sedate Chapel Hill, they found a mixed welcome. No, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Have you guys been inside there? Everything is disgustingly blue. Everything is disgusting. disgustingly blue. Disgusting blue? The official color is called Carolina blue. And if the truth be told, the man for whom the building is named feels defensive about all the tumult. They aren't going to come and move, move us out. We, I will say for the press, they put a royal blue, uh, you know, carpeting there instead of Carolina blues to make them feel at home. Duke debated what Dean had to say and soon agreed it wasn't that bad a joint after all. They were allowed to bring their own ticket takers, and so their fans were met by friendly faces. Still, everywhere was the stuff of a legend. It felt funny. 
I don't know if Dean sat on the same seat that I do, but uh, I wanted him to switch chairs around and stuff like that. So everything's flipped upside down. Duke plays at North Carolina, while North Carolina is playing in Utah. In spite of differences between the schools and their fans, there's one Blue Devil sentiment that Tar Heel fans agree upon wholeheartedly. I want to play Carolina one more time <laughs> in the final game. One more time. Well, I tell you, before that can happen, Carolina has to get by an explosive team from California by the name of Loyola Marymount. And if you haven't seen racehorse basketball, folks, wait till you see this team. That game will be coming your way at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on CBS. Most of you will see that, while others will see Auburn versus Oklahoma, and others also will see DePaul versus Kansas State. And we've got more coming your way here on our halftime show after this. Halftime with Syracuse down seven to Rhode Island. Now also coming up here on CBS at about 2.25 Eastern time, Purdue, the top seed in the Midwest, takes on Memphis State. Over the last five years, Purdue has had trouble punching through to the regionals, but if they do, it will mark a major step in their campaign to put the Boilermakers on the basketball map. Purdue country is in the eyes of the beholder. Some claim it's nowhere, others say it's paradise. Purdue must be in, in chicken country, is it Iowa? Is it in America? I don't have any idea. <laughs> I caught the dead there. <laughs> Where is Purdue University? Well, it's right in the heart of the Hoosier State, halfway between Indiana University and the University of Notre Dame. You know, once you spend some time here on the West Lafayette campus, you find out some impressive things, such as this was the home of Johnny Wooden, the man who won 10 NCAA championships for UCLA. It's also the alma mater of the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong. And this year, it's the home of one of the strongest teams in the NCAA tournament, a Boilermaker squad that is led by three seniors, a formula that has proved to be a winner in tournaments past. Todd Mitchell, Troy Lewis, and Everett Stevens are the senior trio that carried Purdue to their first Big Ten title since 1969. Teams with senior trios have had success in the NCAA tournament in years past, but the Boilermakers have had a history of early exits. In 85, they were first-round losers to Auburn. In 86, LSU knocked them out in the same round. These losses still haunt head coach Gene Cady. When you're playing at this level, and with this importance of, of type championship, and when you put so much heart and soul into it, and when you want to do well, and you want your players to be successful, and experience that feeling, of walking away with the championship, and I don't know what that feels like, and I want to experience that, that it's just frustrating. You know, you want to sit down and cry. Last year, it was the same old story. Florida's in the books with a win over Purdue. So last spring, Katie took his team on a basketball tour and a trip to the South Pacific for, if nothing else, a taste of paradise. We all felt together down there, and uh, we knew that we had a great opportunity uh, coming in this season and uh, you know what happened at the end of the year last year and then we went down to South Pacific we just told ourselves hey we got an opportunity to do something good Thursday the Boilermakers were off and running disposing of fairly Dickinson by 15 points but still they seek a paradise lost paradise is uh, Kansas City you know we we've uh, won the Big Ten title um, we're very happy about that but I, I think that um, the seniors eyes are really set upon a uh, going to Kansas City. Yes, remember the three seniors from Villanova and from North Carolina State. But today, the big obstacle getting past this round, and Memphis State won't be easy. The coach there for the Tigers, perhaps the most underrated coach in college basketball this year. What a job, superb job turned in by Larry Finch. Without his two stars, Marvin Alexander and Sylvester Gray, lost early in the season, he has Memphis State in the round of 32, and today a shot at the number one seed in the Midwest. If Purdue can get past this game, they could perhaps be going to Kansas City. All right, today we'll be trying to take you wherever the action is hot triple header coverage and into the game coverage throughout the day here on CBS. Right now we're getting set to send you back to Chapel Hill where Syracuse is trailing 56-49 to Rhode Island. We'll send you back to Brenton Billy after this message and a word from your local station. Going to Kansas City. and the Orange been shooting 75%. We went away. Douglas was gasping for air, playing under the weather, but it is Rhode Island, Billy, very tired here this half and still 12 minutes to go. Well, that timeout really helped Cena. He's back in the ball game now. He's had a hard time banging down inside against Cycli. Right now, that's who he's matched up with in this 2-3 zone. 
Now goes to score it, but four points. And of course, he's had to work hard at the defensive end against Gary Gannon. Gary is lobbing it back inside. The play is there all day. When you saw the matchup 2-3 zone, Garrick tried to go down inside when Douglas went through, and nobody there to pick up. Now the Orangemen followers who have traveled here to North Carolina start coming alive as their team has closed to within one. They're on an 8-0 run right now. Boy, Duncan and Garrick really doing a lot of banging around on the other side. Coleman Big switch. also banging green on the inside. There was a switch of defensive assignments that time. Not wanting to get Cycli as fourth. Looks like Jimmy Beheim has switched Coleman over on him. Coleman a little uh, argumentative position here saying, I didn't get in the first lick. On Coleman, that is his third personal. Only the third team foul in this half. He got into foul trouble against North Carolina A&T, and Beheim brought him back at a critical point in the game. And he played out with four fouls and did a good job. And there was another foul going against Syracuse. That was against Duncan over there on the far side, his second. Duncan, a powerful young man, really had Cena in the corner, and it's a good double team. Well, Syracuse is up at 68. It has not been an aggressive inside defense employed by Rhode Island. And Billy Blackwood is holding the line, shorthanded. Owens, oh, nice Green with an offensive rebound. Let's lean in. Boy, well, great block out on his part. He put Coleman too far into the basket. Thompson as Syracuse comes right back. Missouri closed in on Rhode Island in the first round, and then the Rams put them away in the second half. That's a three. Not there, but Thompson's got an easy offensive rebound. Evans is on that side of the zone. They're very small in the back of the zone right now with Evans and Cena.